Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name. We pray that everything said and done here tonight brings you and you alone all the honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So he, he brought up the fire starter thing. And where that came from was on the third anniversary of my accident. So I had this accident in 2006 that I'm going to share tonight. But on the third anniversary of the accident, I'm speaking at this church out in South Dakota. And I'm out in the middle of, like, literally nowhere. And uh, it's, this, it's this big, long, ugly story, really. But... Um, it gets to the end of the, so I get invited, to this, I'll give you a little bit of background. I get invited to this church, but they say you can't speak on Sunday, you have to speak on Sunday night. And so I spoke at a different church somewhere else, like in Sioux Falls or something Sunday morning, and I speak at this church Sunday night, and I get there, I'm in the back, and maybe an hour early, and I'm like, uh, you know, asking ushers, where's the pastor at, you know, can I meet the pastor? And he says, well, pastor's not coming, he kind of gave me a funny look, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. And so... Uh, didn't know what to think, you know, what to do. Usually, I'm the first time at a church, the pastor always wants to be there to check me out and make sure I don't say anything weird or off, you know, you know what I'm saying? And so, I'm like, okay, so then this lady who was my contact, she comes, and we're talking and stuff, and what I found out later was, the pastor didn't want me at the church at all, because that church didn't believe that God does miracles today, but like, the president of the congregation and the biggest giver wanted me there, so she says, we're going to have them, or I'm going to quit the church. So the pastor's like, you can have them, but not during the Sunday service. Do a special service, and I'm not going to come. I'm not going to endorse them. So that's what, I didn't know any of this going into it. So I show up at this place. I speak. The place is packed out. And we, we start praying, and God starts doing miracles. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a denomination, like I said, that they don't believe in miracles. And so picture this old church built in the 1800s, and like beautiful, ornate woodwork, you know what I'm saying, with the you know, stained glass windows and the wooden pews and all that. And right in the middle is this baptismal font for the babies, you know, big, huge, big brown baptismal font and this, this crazy beautiful uh, communion rail and this big ornate uh, altar in the back, you know, and stuff. And so the Lord had me, um, so a bunch of stuff happens, but then when it comes time for prayer, and, and they're not used to prayer, they don't, they don't touch each other, no laying on hands in the church, right? And so I pray for the first lady and God heals her, like dramatically heals this lady, and then the Lord says, don't, there's a it's pews, right, with one main aisle, and there's a black folding chair there. And the Lord says, don't pray for the next one. You just stop, and you have that lady that just got healed. You have her pray for the next one. So she flips down. I said, all right, you're, you pray just the way I prayed. And, I, and they're not used to praying like this. So I like, kind of teach her, you know, just kind of show her, and that lady gets healed. And pretty soon people are like, whoa, you know. And they're like getting closer and getting closer like cows, right. They're coming up, they're coming up, and they're getting closer. And they're still like all watching, and they're getting more excited, more excited. And every person gets healed, everyone, everyone. So the Holy Spirit says, get away from them and go way over here and just pray. So I'm over, I'm like about right here. And uh, the front pew, this front wooden pew was gone. They removed it at some point in time. This church was built long enough ago that they didn't use pianos or no music because this denomination didn't believe in music. They thought it wasn't godly. But at some point, they changed their mind and decided a, a piano was okay. So they cut a hole. Picture it. They cut a hole in the wall right here. And they built a little lean-to off the side of the church right here. Just literally a little lean-to off the side of the church right here. And they removed, so the pew was in two sections. They removed one section of the pew and put it all the way to the back of this lean-to, and there was a baby grand in there. And all that would fit in that lean-to was the baby grand in that pew all the way to the back. So I'm like, you know, and so it's, the pews are like this, and I got one aisle here, and I'm like right here, and the Holy Spirit says, just, you just stay away from them, just let them pray. And they're getting louder and louder, and it's just like getting crazier and crazier. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, go into that. You, you stepped on this side. The piano was here. You stepped on this side of the piano and, he, and the Holy Spirit says go into that lean-to go into that little room there I mean it's small right and the second I stepped over the threshold of the you know into that space all of a sudden I see Jesus literally see Jesus sitting at that pew and it, without even thinking I could not think it, it just happened so fast I didn't even think about it all of a sudden I find myself on the carpet with my forehead pressed to the carpet like I am like prostrate before the Lord without even thinking there was no thought oh I should lay down no 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 I'm just bam I'm down and my forehead is down and I hear him say no come sit next to me so I'm like oh man I'm, I'm like it's like you know I mean it's <laughs> so God comes as a lion and he comes as a lamb right I mean he's there's the he's our creator right I mean he he deserves respect he has awe there's awe for the for God right so I mean it was like kind of scary I mean so I like I get up, and he's just, just this ball of light, basically, with a man in the middle of it. I could, you know, and people say, well, what do you look like? Man, I didn't want to look, honestly. I mean, it was like, 
I'm serious. It was just too, too much. And so I sit down, and now we're sitting behind the piano just like this. Oh, in the, in the lean-to, though, and the piano's in front of us. And he's sitting right here next to me, and I won't even look at him. And he's, he points just like this, and the people are just going crazy, like getting, you know, raising their hands and stuff. And he points like this with his right arm. He's pointing, and he says, do you see that? They don't even know you're gone. <laughs> oh, pride checker, right? They don't even know you're gone. And I'm going, wait a minute, what do they mean by that? You know, I'm trying to like thinking like what, you know, before I could like get all too freaked out, he just has his hand pointed like that. And he says, that's what I want you to do. You go into places and start fires and go to the next place and do the same thing. And it was literally on the third anniversary of my accident. Third anniversary accident. So then the last thing he said was, they don't need a superstar evangelist. They need to know that I love them and I want to answer their prayers. And boom, he's gone like that. Now I'm in there just crying and weeping and freaking out. I stay in there forever, right? And I came out and I said, the Lord was talking to me. I didn't say that like Jesus showed up. I just said the Lord was talking to me. And I thought about it. I drove eight hours the next day home. It was an eight-hour drive. And I drove that whole day. And he was literally, so I mean, I know what it felt like to be sitting next to him, right? And so the, the, the eight-hour drive home across 90, he was sitting next to me in the car, but I couldn't see him. And I cried literally for eight hours straight. The whole ride home, I cried for eight hours straight. And it just kept washing down on me and washing down on me, but I thought about it later, you know, the pastor preached a sermon that Sunday morning, and he knew my first book, which was a Christian bestseller, I didn't bring that tonight, I brought the new one, but the first book was a Christian bestseller, and it was about God speaking to us, and the pastor preached a sermon how God no longer, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak except through the Bible, that's it, and so he preached a sermon against what he thought I was going to say that night, right, and I thought about it later, and the Holy Spirit showed me, Jesus wasn't really welcome in that church, and that's why he was out in the lean-to. That's why he was out there. He wasn't in the church proper. He was in the lean-to, watching it happen. And uh, so that whole thing about fire started, that's where that came from, uh, because he said, go in a place and start fires. And so um, I share my testimony, and I share whatever God puts on my heart, and yeah, and here I am, you know. Uh, so he had mentioned, Bill had mentioned about uh, Isaiah. So because I'm gone traveling like all the time. I've already spoken over 140 times this year. I speak um, 25 to 30,000 people a year in, you know, groups, whatever, however big. But that's what it ends up at the end of the year. That's not including, like, the millions from uh, media. So, like, 700 Club, you guys right? 700 Club. Right now, my story is the most replayed testimony they've ever had in the history of the show. They've reused it more times. They don't like to use it more than two or three times, and they use mine like 20 times already. They just keep redoing it because the response is so, so big every time. And now they're starting to use, I don't know if anybody's seen this, but now they're starting to use stories from miracles that we're seeing in our ministries. Anybody, any regular 700 Club watchers? Did you, any of you guys see the one with the, the kid from Portland with the... Christopher Gunderson with the creative miracle in his intestines and all that. They just replayed that one again last week or week before. Did you, saw, did you see that one, Christopher Gunderson? So uh, they're starting to use stories, you know, testimonies from our ministry because we go out and see God and, you know, I can't do any miracles, but I know who can. Right. Jesus, right? And so we see him, you know, open blind eyes and open deaf ears and people get out of wheelchairs and tumors fall off. It's pretty cool. Uh, how many of you saw the movie The Finger of God? Finger God. So Finger God, 90% of that movie was taped at a place called The Hub in Chicagoland. And so the lady who runs The Hub is a lady named Nancy McGuire. She sits on the board for Iris Ministries, for the Airport Church in Toronto, for Reinhard Bunke, and for Patricia King. She's on those four boards, but she's based out of Chicago. And uh, she had heard that I was going to be coming to Chicagoland. She invited me to come in and speak. And we prayed on the phone, and she's had this tumor on her throat for like a long time. Like literally a tumor on her throat. And so it's illegal. I don't know what it is. Is it illegal to talk on the cell phone here and drive? Okay, well, in some places, like in Wisconsin, you can do it out in the boonies, you know, like where I live. You can talk on the cell phone all you want, but you just can't do it in the cities proper. And so, but in Chicagoland, it's illegal. So we were talking on the phone, and she pulled over, and we just did this little short prayer on the, on the phone, and the tumor fell off, and she opened her eyes, and it was laying on her black dress. Right there. I mean, as we just did a little prayer on the phone, and it falls off. So she got pretty excited. So then she calls the airport church. She's like, you got to have this guy in. So it's just like it went to the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. And God just keeps opening doors for police. You know, and, and that's how it was with Isaiah, too, because um, my pastor's son had seen him on YouTube or something. 
And uh, so he's like, oh, this guy's all crazy, and, you know, we got to have him in. And so they, some of them went out there, and they checked it out, and then they came back, and the pastor's like, yeah, let's have him in. And so he, but I never got to see him because I was always out ministering. I'm always gone. But my wife and kids, because we're in leadership at that church, my wife and kids got to, you know, hang out with him after the services at the pastor's house and all this. And so uh, he heard my story when he got one of my books. And so he, one of the times I got to connect with him at our church, and then we spent, a, you know, the, the night together or whatever after the service, and he said, man, come out to Manteca. So I was doing an international conference in San Diego, and it was cool because I had my family with me. My family actually did the worship. My four teenagers did the worship for the conference. And then uh, we drove up to San Francisco, which is, Manteca's basically just, like, west of San Francisco, or east of San Francisco. And... Uh, we did the, did the Manteca thing. That was, I, I should have looked on my thing. It was earlier this year. I don't, my, my months all run together. I, don't, I have a hard time keeping track of what month. And I don't even know what day it is usually, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, it all started, you know, the, the ministry started with the accident. That was a platform. I was called into ministry at a young age, very young, but I ran away like Jonah. And you know what? It's, for me, I can look at this 22-year-old young guy, Isaiah, and uh, like Pastor Ben gets up and introduces me at Manteca, and he goes, some people yell it, and some people tell it. He goes, Isaiah yells it, Bruce tells it. So it's going to be a different kind of, you know, because they're used to him, like, bah, 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 you know, bam, 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 machine gun style all night, right? And I just, I don't, it's not me, right? So he goes, some people yell it, some people tell it. Bruce is going to tell it tonight. He kind of like prepped them for me, you know? So, uh, but it's funny because, um, you know, you can look at that guy. He's 22. He's only been saved three years. He's radical for God. All these people have gone through there. I mean, he's spoken for Reinhard Bunke. He's spoken for Rick Joyner. He's, you know, invited these huge conferences and all this stuff. And what it is is God just looking for anybody that's sold out. God just looking for somebody that's sold out. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't call the anointed, right? He anoints the called, and we're all called. He's just looking for anybody who's sold out for him. That's what it is. And uh, so... I hope tonight you came with expectation. I, I travel around, like I said, all the time. I'm speaking like every other day, place after place after place. And we were having a conversation in the car. And I don't remember if it was with you or the first two and a half hour ride before I met you today. But talking about it today and last night at the person's house, you know, like I said, I'm place to place. But, you know, they're like, well, what did you think of the meeting, this meeting or that meeting? I'm like, oh, you know, it was all right, you know. And we, like Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, what day is today? Okay, it's just Monday. All right, so yesterday morning, yesterday morning at the church in uh, wherever it was, Oliver. Yesterday morning at the church in Oliver, so this, uh, this uh, a native woman comes forward, and she had a locked shoulder, and she could move it like this much, and she was on disability, and she had a two-pound weight limit, and she had a knee that was just operated on and all messed up, and she comes forward, and the Lord told me when she was coming up, I just, you know, he said, she's going to get totally healed. So it didn't matter what she had. So when she comes forward and she's like, yeah, I'm on totally disability because I got two-pound weight limit on this, on this arm. Actually, it was her right arm. And uh, she's like, I can't, this is how much I can move it. You know, it's chronic pain. And, you know, my knee is all messed up. And she comes homing up there. She's like, I'm supposed to be in crutches, but I'm not using them today. I've left them in the car. And so she's there and we start praying, and God, bam, opens the shoulder, and pretty soon she's doing this. She's doing windmills. She's got full range of motion, and her 20-year-old daughter just loses it. Her 20-year-old daughter sees her arm moving like that. She just starts screaming, crying, right? So then the knee gets healed. So then the Lord says, okay, we're just starting on her now, right? God said, that's the physical stuff. Now we've got to get to the real stuff. And he says, she's got heart issues from childhood. So I lean down, and I'm about to say something. She starts laughing, right? And she's like trying to hold it in, but it's laughing. I said, what's going on? She says, I feel like I'm getting tickled on the inside. And so I said, Holy Spirit, what, is he, what are you doing right now? And he said, that's when he said, she's got issues all the way back to childhood, deep, deep, you know, pain. She's got pain and, and heart on her heart all the way back to childhood. And I want to just go in there and carve that stuff off right now. So I start whispering in her ear about her child, and word, God starts giving words of knowledge right about her childhood, and I'm whispering in her ear so nobody else can hear. And uh, she's laughing and crying at the same time. And it goes on for like 20 minutes, half an hour, I don't know, it was just forever. But then her daughter gets healed. So then her daughter comes up, and her daughter's just wiped out after seeing mom get it. So then her daughter gets healed. And, you know, that's really, that's what it looks like to start fires. I mean, all it is is saying, because I'm, I'm just Joe Blow mechanic, I'm nobody. I'm just some hick from the sticks in Wisconsin. There is nothing special about me. I'm just out doing what God has told me to do. That's it. There's, there's nothing else other than that. And uh, when, you bring, when you bring what he's got, I don't have anything, but you bring what he's got, it's always more than enough. Amen? Right? That's what it looks like. 
So have expectation, not in me, but in him. Amen? So growing up, I did not grow up in a religious home. That's why I'm not Mr. Religious Guy. That's why I tend to ruffle the religious feathers a lot. And I'll have religious people get up and walk out of churches pretty much almost every service. But I, I've been doing pretty good here. I don't think it's just been a couple, maybe three or four so far in the last couple of days. So, you know, again, I didn't grow up religious guy. So my family, where I grew up, my, my mom was a non-practicing Catholic. She got pregnant at 15 and, you know, goes out and leaves home. My dad was a non-practicing Lutheran. And we might go to church. If you would ask my parents if they believed in God, they'd say, yeah. But we didn't go to church Christmas, Easter, something like that. That's the only time we ever went to church. And so uh, I didn't have anybody like tell me about God or anything like that. I grew up in a family that was drugs and alcohol, nothing hidden. It was all in the open. It was hardcore partying. I grew up in a family where there was physical abuse and verbal abuse. And I saw my mom and dad like fighting like cats and dogs like my whole life growing up. And my mom would leave and my dad split apart and come back and all that. That's, you know, it's just that constant thing. I'm the oldest of three boys. My next brother didn't come for like eight or nine years. I was eight and a half or so before Josh came. And so uh, my dad was a truck driver. My mom uh, did interpreting. She was an interpreter. Her first language is Spanish. My mom is 100% Mexican. You can't tell by looking at me. I've only actually been to one place in the world, because I'm traveling all the time. I've been to one place in the world where people are walking up and saying, you're only half white. What's the other half? I'm like, you're kidding me. You are kidding me. Nobody ever catches it. Nobody ever sees it. It was multiple people. You know, it was Hawaii. I don't, I don't even understand that, but it was Hawaii. Like one after another, they're saying, you know, anyway. So I'm half, half Mexican, right? So my mom is Mexican. She's an interpreter. My dad's a truck driver. And they're gone. And, and so I had to stay with this other family as babysitters. You know, so I'd be at this place for a week or two at a time. And they were party people from, with my mom and dad's lifestyle. And they were molesting their two kids and they had a little boy and a little girl, and because I lived there on and off, I was getting molested. Something about people that are molested, even sometimes raped, they are somehow manipulated into not telling. So somehow, these people manipulated me and not telling my mom and dad. So I never told my mom and dad what's going on. It's going on for a year, year and a half, you know. So now I'm like five and a half years old. I only went to Sunday school one time as a child. My whole growing up, I went to Sunday school once, and it was because my grandpa and grandma took me, my grandpa and grandma took me on a weekend, but they babysat me. And because they were regular Lutheran church attenders, I went to Sunday school because they went to adult Bible, Bible study or whatever. And so it was this little bitty small rural church in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, with like 30 people. And there's like three kids in the Sunday school. And we go down in the basement of this musty smelling, you know, old stinky church, right? And we're out in the basement. And, uh, the, and I, I remember it because it was the one time, the one time as a kid I was in Sunday school. And the guy tells, and so I was kind of freaked out because. First of all, I'd never been, never been in Sunday school, never been in that kind of context. And, you know, Christmas and Easter where it's all packed with all people and you're sitting with your mom and dad is different. But now I'm, like, all alone with this guy in the basement with a couple of the kids. And he's telling the story about um, where the parents are bringing the kids to Jesus to have them bless them and hug them. That story from the Bible, that's the story that he's telling. And so he's telling that story, and we're coloring some picture with, you know, bearded kid hugging kids or something, Right? So we're calling this picture, you know, with crayons of this bearded guy hugging kids, and he's telling the story about Jesus, and, you know, the disciples get mad, and they tell the, the parents, get these kids out of here, we got more important stuff to, to do than mess around with kids. Jesus rebukes the disciples and says, let the children come to me. So he says, this proves that Jesus loves kids, and if you pray to him, you guys, you kids, you know, we're all little, you pray to him that he's going to hear you and listen to you. And First of all, I was like freaked out about the guy because I, I think it's the first time I'd ever seen somebody in a suit. I'd never seen anybody in a suit before. And uh, circa 1975, brown, polyester, long, pointy collar, big button suit. You know what I'm saying, right? Goodwill special, right? So he's got this weird clothing that I'd never seen before. So he's, you know, that seemed, it sounds weird, but I remember thinking the guy looked really weird how he's dressed because I'd never seen anybody in a suit before, I don't think. And so he's, he's telling this thing about Jesus, and I remember thinking that I didn't believe it. I remember thinking as a kid, now, Missouri in the United States, Missouri used to say on their license plate, who knows it, the, what does it say? Does anybody know? No. The show me state. state. Right across the top of the plate, the show me state. So in other words, they're saying, look, we're not going to believe just what you're saying. Show me, right? And that's who I am. 
That's just my personality. It's the way I've been since a little kid. I think the tougher situations you grow up in, the more you're probably like that. The more you've been on the street, the more you've been around, the more you're like that. Blah, 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 blah. Say whatever you want, but show me, right? And so this guy tells a story about Jesus, and he makes it sound like Jesus makes everything great for little kids. And I'm like, no. Then Jesus can't be real because not everything's great for me. I'm getting molested, and I wouldn't even know that was a word, but I knew what was happening to me sexually at this place. I got a mom and dad that are always fighting. I got a, a mom and dad that are verbally abusive and physically abusive and all this stuff. So, no, Jesus can't be real then. And you know what's sad? As I travel around, I talk to people about Jesus. There are plenty of adults that use that same reasoning. They say, well, God can't be real because what about the starving kid in Africa? And what about grandma died? And what about mom that died? Or what about this and what about that? And God can't be real, right? So it's that same kind of thinking. And I had it as a five and a half year old kid. I'm like, yeah, it just can't be real because the guy is making it sound like Jesus makes everything great for kids. So I just like stick the story on the shelf and forget about it. And like, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight months go by. And this is really where my testimony with God starts. This is really where it all starts. And that one story, and that one Sunday school story, even though I didn't believe it at the time, it was a seed that was planted. And God works on the seed principle. Amen? The seeds that are planted. And they're going to come to fruition someday. So the seed gets planted. I stick it away. I don't believe it, but I put it away somewhere, right? Five, six, seven, eight months goes by. My mom was home. This family comes over, and they're in the kitchen partying. And uh, me and these other little kids are in this room. And I begin to exhibit some sexual behavior with one of these other little kids. And my mom acting out of the stuff that's, I'm getting molested at this place, right? And acting out of that. And my mom comes into the room and catches me, catches us. And she loses it, man. She freaked out. She lost it. She's yelling. She's screaming. She was crying. And uh, she says, you wait till your father gets home, and you're going to have to tell him what I just caught you doing. And she's thinking that her kid is some sexual deviant, not realizing that I'm being molested and that I'm just acting out of being molested. And so, uh, I mean, I felt so guilty and so horrible, right? And so I knew, my dad is violent, and so I knew what that meant. I mean, my dad is severely violent. Like, his idea of a good time when I was a kid growing up, and even the last time I know of when he was 55 years old, is going to the bar and beating up multiple people at the same time. Like calling out like four or five guys, not like one guy. That's my dad. It's the way he's wired. And so I know my dad. And even as a kid, I knew what that was going to be. You know, I was going to get crazy beat, right? I was afraid. And so I'm laying on the bed, and my dad was, came home. And my dad would take drugs to stay awake back in those days. He'd take drugs to stay awake, and then he'd drink to come down. And so he might stay awake two, three, four days, but then he'd drink alcohol and sleep for 30 hours or whatever. So he's in that cycle. My mom's afraid to tell him. She sets me on top of their bed. There's a wooden door. There's the kitchen table. They're sitting at the table. He's drinking, and I'm listening. I remember when I got home, my, it was light outside. By the time she finally told him, it was dark. So I don't know how much time had passed. I'm laying in there just like on pins and needles, and I'm feeling dirty, and I'm feeling ashamed, and I'm feeling like I'm the absolute worst kid in the whole entire world. And I'm just waiting for my, my, you know, I'm waiting for it to happen. And finally, I hear her tell him. And when she tells him, he broke a couple of the chairs, the kitchen table chairs. He literally shattered these two chairs. He busted some dishes. And I'm hearing him saying stuff. And I heard him say, I might as well kill the little blank, blank, and blank, 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 right? And right in that, I'm crying. I mean, I'm like just totally feeling like the worst person in the world. Right in that super bad moment, the thought that seed that was planted comes to my mind. And it just, the Holy Spirit, I, don't, I didn't know then it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, one of the jobs, it says in John chapters 14, 15, 16, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of things that Jesus said. And he reminds me of what the Sunday school teacher said. So doubting Thomas' prayer, right? Because I didn't believe it. I go, all right, what have I got to lose, right? Jesus, if you're real, then I want you to come and hug me right now like you did those kids in that story, because all I wanted was to be comforted. I'm laying there crying, and I wasn't going to get comfort from my mom, and I sure wasn't going to get it from my dad, and all I wanted was to be held and comforted, so I just said, if you're real, then you come and hug me like you hug those kids, and when I said it, instantly, somebody grabs me, pulls me up into their chest, and I'm getting a full-on hug, like hard pressure hug like this on the bed. My mom and dad are still in the room. There's nobody else in the house. There's nobody else there. I'm getting this hug, so I'm getting a physical hug. I couldn't see anybody. I didn't see anything, right? But I'm getting this hug. But then all of a sudden, it's like getting dipped in liquid love from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And I'll be 45 in, a couple, in an April. And to this day, I have never again in my life ever experienced that kind of 
depth of love, that experience. And as I travel around and share it, and it's in both the books, I have people email me and write me and text me and, you know, say, you know, I was in this really bad spot, and I called it to Jesus, and I had this throne room experience, and that love that you're talking about, that liquid love, I felt it. I mean, I know many Christians around the world have, have felt that, but the, the common denominator is it's always in a time of, like, crazy trial, always in a time of, like, utter end of the rope, utter despair, right? Because Jesus knows what we need and when we need it. And so I am, like, dipped in this liquid love, all the dirtiness, all the shame, all the guilt, all the, the fear, everything is just being washed away in this liquid love, like a river of love, washing away, washing away. I'm being hugged, and pretty soon I can't hear the yelling, and I can't hear nothing going on right on the other side of the door, and boom, I'm out. Next thing I wake up in the morning, still dressed, still on top of my mom and dad's bed, and I'm going, I'm thinking about it. I'm laying there. The sun is shining in the room. I'm going, man, recounting what happened in that, the last memories of my mind, and here's five-and-a-half-year-old theology for you. I just go, man, there's something to this Jesus thing, <laughs> right? I know what I said, and I know what happened, and that was as real as real can be. So for me, it's just like, click, he's real. So I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus was real from that point in my life. I mean, that was it. And the other thing that happened starting at that point, so in the Bible, when holy hands are laid on, usually what happened in Acts, right? When holy hands are laid on, the people receive the right? The Holy Ghost, right? The hands are laid on, they receive the Holy Ghost. And so what happened for me, and then the gifts usually follow. So what happened at five and a half years old after I had holy hands laid on me, literally, I started getting dreams and visions and words of knowledge and all this stuff. And so I would tell my mom and dad, something would happen. I'd say, I dreamt this, or I saw this, or I'd tell them something about one of their friends, and then it would happen. And they'd be like, what? Where, where are you coming up with this? And they'd be like, shut up, you're just guessing stuff. And they like, you know, they just like discounted it to the point where I just didn't tell anybody, right? But the stuff happened, but I didn't tell anybody. And the thing was, I never told one single person about being molested, and I never told one single person about getting hugged by Jesus for 20 years. The first time I told somebody was I was 25. And you know, as I travel around, I share this testimony. And sometimes I start with this, sometimes I don't, and I just felt led to, to do it tonight. But when I share this, you wouldn't believe the number of people that come up to me and say, I'm 65 years old. I was repeatedly molested by my dad, my brother, my uncle, my, my, you know, whatever. And I've never told anyone. You're the first person I'm telling right now. It happens over and over and over and over, like place after place. I did some research. I do a lot of a prison and jail ministry. I love it there because I can relate with those guys. I mean, I should be there. That's the life I lived. I should be there. I should be in jail for life, for real. And so, I mean, I just, I feel bad when I'm there because I know I should be there. And so I can relate to them. I mean, we, we're on the same page. And what I found out, 90% of people in jail have been molested. It's that high. 90% of people in jail have been molested. It's like it does stuff, man. It messes stuff up. It can, but Jesus comes to set the captive free, amen? amen? So the first person I told what happened to me was this atheist bartender that I was dating. And we're in this argument about Jesus. And it's a, again, it's another long, ugly story, but... I was saying that Jesus was real, and uh, so I'll just I'll give you a little more. So the, 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 the whole thing was, so I'm dating this girl. I, I move away for three years. I, I live in Oklahoma for three years. I move back to Wisconsin. I'm dating this girl, and uh, so I hear some things about her, and we're like, I break up with her because of these things I heard about her, and uh, some of my friends that had never left home told me about her and so I break up with her and she shows up one night at my house I wake up in the morning she's laying on the on the foot of my bed where she's been there crying all night and I wake up in the morning like what are you doing here and she's like well look you know I've never I don't think I've never loved anyone before so tell me what I did wrong and so that I don't screw it up again and I was like I was too embarrassed to tell her what the real reason was so I'm thinking what can I do to like get rid of her and I said all right here's the deal I'm like um you said that you were raised in an atheist home, right? She's like, yeah. And she, her dad was like the guy that would argue with Christians. And, he, and so because she grew up listening to that, she could do that. She could argue the, the atheist argument, right? Because she grew up listening to it. And so she's like, yeah. And I said, well, here's the deal. I said, I believe in God. And because you say you don't believe in God, I said, we can't, we can't be together. And she's like, what are you talking about? And somewhere I had heard this unequally yoked thing. And so I said, you know, we just can't be together. It's like being unequally yoked. She's like, what does that mean? I said, I'm not sure, but, you know, we just can't be together, right? So I'm, it was a lie, right? 
so she's like, well, no one's ever told me about Jesus. Tell me about him. <laughs> so, so she's got all these arguments, right? She's got, and I start trying to tell her stuff, and she'd argue every point, man. She had it. I mean, she'd argue me in a circle every time, and I couldn't say anything to her. And so she's like, tell me. She says, you, I said, trust me, Jesus is real. I'm just trust me, Jesus is real. And she's like, well, tell me why. Give me one reason. And I, I had one reason, right? He came when I called him. I said, Jesus, if you're real, come and hug me. And he did, but I never told anybody, and I didn't want to tell her. So I'm, I'm, after six hours, she wears me down. I just want her to leave my house, right? And after six hours, I said, all right, all right, if I tell you the reason why Jesus is real, will you just leave? Will you go away? And she's like, yeah, you tell me why Jesus is real, and I'll leave. I said, all right, this is what happened. And I told her what happened, and she, we're sitting on my bed. We're still in my bedroom. Um, she's sitting on my bed next to me like this. She was actually on this side. And I tell her what happened, and she just, like, breaks down crying. And so I'm just watching her, right? And so she's crying, and my dresser was right over there. And, like, halfway through that conversation, I remember, halfway through the conversation, she's like, let me get this straight. She says, we can't be together because you say God is real and I don't, and I don't believe in God, right? And I said, yeah. She says, you know what? You're not like those goody two-shoes Christians that I know. She points to my, underneath my dresser was a brown paper bag where my triple beam was because I sold drugs. So underneath my dresser was a brown paper bag with a triple beam. In my dresser on one side is like a pound and a half of weed that I got like quartered out. In the other top drawer, there's like a whole bunch, a couple ounces of blow, coke in there. And she's like, you sell drugs. You get high from the time you get up till the time you go to bed. You're at the bar all the time. That's how I met her, right? She's a bartender. She says, you're at the bar all the time like slopping, like trashed out drunk. You don't talk about Jesus. You never say about God. She says, why does God, why does it matter to you? right? Why does it matter to you? Anyway, because you, you don't do any of this church stuff anyway. I'm like, trust me, it matters, right? I'm lying. I'm like, trust me, it matters. And so I get to this point, I tell this story, and she breaks down crying, and I'm just watching. I'm thinking, okay, this is a little bit too much, you know? I, she's overreacting in my mind. I'm just watching her, and she starts to say, well, you know, that same stuff happened to me as a kid, and because of it, I've done a lot of stuff I'm ashamed of, and it was the stuff that my friends had told me about, right? And, I'll, and I'm looking at her, and she calls out to Jesus, sitting on the end of my bed without me doing anything. She calls out to Jesus. She's like, Jesus, if you're real, then come to me too. And boom, she gets Jesus sitting on the end of my bed, right? <laughs> and what's really, here's, I got to tell you the rest of the story because I already went this far. But what had happened was, so I had moved back home. I dated this, this one girl, not her, but I dated this girl all the way through high school, and we had broke up, right? We broke up, and she was the one person in the world that I thought that loved me because I equated sex with love. And so I didn't feel loved by my mom and dad at all. I didn't, you know, I didn't get love from my mom and dad, but this girlfriend I had, I felt like she was the one person in the world that loved me. And so she cheated on me. We break up. We were engaged to get married. We break up. I'm all tore up. I'm miserable. All the drugs and alcohol, I'm just miserable in life. And I just spiraled totally out of control. And I'm at the point of committing suicide. And this one night, 911, because I'd said, Jesus, if you're real, come and hug me. But I'd only prayed to him like five times my whole life. And every time I did, it was like only in utter despair, 911. And so I'm laying in bed one night. We're getting ready to go out. My roommate, we'd leave at 9 and 9 at night and like party all night and get home the next day, right? And we had the same routine every night. And it's like, he's knocking on my door. He's like, dude, it's time to go. Come on. I'm like, man, I can't go tonight, man. Just go without me. Just leave. I just can't go. And um, so I stay up all, like two hours, and I just prayed. I'm like, God, I'm going to kill myself if, you know, I just want one. I need one person. I need one person in the world that will love me for the loser I am. Just one person, send one person to love me for the loser, please. And I, I raced, ice raced motorcycles. And the next day was Sunday morning. That was Saturday night. And the next day was Sunday morning. And I, we always raced on Sunday morning. Studded, studded, they do that around here? It's probably no ice here, is there? So studded motorcycles on ice, right? And so we do it in the, in the rivers and the lakes and all that. And uh, so the, usually a bar would sponsor it. And after the races, then they'd hand out the trophies at the bar. And so... Uh, that handled the trophies at the bar. So my motorcycle was broken, so that Sunday I didn't race. But I went there anyway because I always that's what I did. And so um, after the race, we go to the local tavern where they're handing out the bar, you know, at the bar where they hand out the trophies and stuff, me and my buddies. And I go up, I get my whiskey, you know, and we're sitting over by the, by the pool table with my buddy Strozzi. And I look up at the bar, 
and there's these, there was a horseshoe shaped bar with a dropped, a dropped ceiling around it, like the thing. And, and I'm looking up there and literally I just thought like I had my first drink. I'd only smoked a couple pinchies and I'm looking up there and I see like this bright light shine on this blonde. And I said to Sterling, I said, man, does it look like there's a light shine on that chick? He's like, shut up, dude. If you want to talk to her, just go talk to her. I said, no, I'm serious. Does it look like there's a light shining on her or not? And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you don't see that? He's like, shut up. So I go up there. I'm like, I slam my drink down. I go up there, and she was sitting next to Susie, this, this brunette, and I slip up right between them. And this, the ceiling was dropped there, and I thought there must be some can lights, and she must be like a can light on or something. So I look up into the thing to see if there's a can light shining on, and there wasn't. There were can lights, but they weren't even on. I'm thinking, man, that's really weird. You know, I small talk, flirted a little bit, get a whiskey. I go back. We're sitting there. We're playing the pool, you know, and I'm just like back like five minutes. And she turned to this way to say something to Susie. Or it was a roommate. And her teeth looked like they were glowing, like a, crest, like a cheesy Crest commercial. I mean, they were like glowing out of her head. And I'm like, Strozzi, look, that chick's teeth are glowing now, man. Do you see that? And he's like trying to take my whiskey away from me. He's like, I'm shutting you off, man. I'm like, no, shut up, dude. Don't you see that? You can't see that? He's like, shut up. And I'm like, you can't see that. He's like, you're crazy, dude. So I go, I mean, so I ended up asking her on a date. We're inseparable from the night I asked. That was the day after I'd spent two hours saying, God, send somebody that'll love me for the loser I am, right? So all of a sudden, and I don't, I'm so stupid. I didn't put two and two together, right? <laughs> I, didn't re I never did, like, figure out what the light was or the teeth. I mean, it didn't, like, I was just like, that was really crazy, you know. And uh, so we're inseparable, and I don't realize. I was like, I don't even know how I even, I don't even know what I thought. I'm so dumb. So, so now, like, two months goes by, and I hear all this stuff, and I'm trying to break up with her, and we're on the bed, and she receives Jesus. And, and I go to hug her, and as soon as I hug her, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I don't even know why I'm going this direction tonight. But uh, the whole, as soon as I hug her, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, I sent you the exact person that would love you and understand you because she's been through the things that you've been through. And you're going to kick her to the curb because she's doing the same things that you're doing? And I'm like, oh, God. And I just hugged her so tight. <laughs> and we've been married for 20 years and have four kids. <laughs> we... We got married like, we got married like almost instantly, like months. It was just like, okay, uncle, man, she's the one, all right. But uh, I don't know, somebody must have needed to hear that because I don't usually share that from the front. But so growing up as this kid, I'm the naughty kid, right? I was the naughty kid. So my, if this was my hometown, like right now, if there was anybody from my hometown, my last name would mean something to you. It would mean trouble. From my grandpa, when he came back from World War II, to my dad, to me, to my brothers, trouble with the law, trouble with drugs, trouble with alcohol, bar fights, shootouts, you name it, trouble. Like trouble, seriously. Like the wrong side of the tracks, the bad family. So growing up in school, I was the kid that was always getting kicked out of school, always getting kicked off the bus, always getting in fights, teaching the other the goody two-shoe kids how to swear, bringing in girly magazines that my dad had. I mean, I was that kid, right? And I did, like, over-the-top bad stuff, like, all the time. And so I grew up poor, and uh, my dad, you know, was more worried about drinking beer than other things. And so I got one pair of pants and one shirt at the beginning of the school year. And I had to wear the same shirt and pants to school every day. But I grew up in a town that was a paper mill town. And paper mill town was, like, middle income, and we were, like, way low income. And so these, these rich kids, what I would call rich kids, would make fun of me for wearing the same clothes every day. So I just have to beat them up. And then I get kicked out of school. And then it just was like this cycle that just kept going year after year, week after week, you know. And it's like I didn't care if I, you know, and if I got beat up, I'd go home and I'd, my dad would like, hey, no Van Natta gets beat up. You go back to school and you kick that kid's blankety blank tomorrow. Don't worry, I got your back with the teacher. You go back, you get that kid, right? And so it would happen. And sometimes I'd get up beat repeatedly. I remember one kid beat repeatedly before I finally beat that kid up. Because my dad was like, no way, no way, you go back. So, so I grew up in this family, and I'm growing with this craziness and seeing people drink and seeing people do drugs and all of it, none of it hidden. And I got all this pain, man. I got all this hurt inside of me, and I just want it to go away. And I'm watching all these people, and I watch the people that were the cokeheads and, you know, the drinkers. Sometimes, 
you know, with drinking alcohol, I'll guarantee a lot of people know what I'm talking about. Sometimes Mr. Happy would show up. Like my dad would drink, and he'd be Mr. Happy. But the next night, Mr. Crappy would show up. And you never know who it was going to be, right? It could be Mr. Happy or it could be Mr. Crappy. And what was Mr. Crappy? It was ugly, right? It was bad. And so, I, you know, it's like you can't trust the drinkers and you can't trust the cokeheads. But these guys that hung around smoked doobies, they were just like all like chilled out all the time. It's like, you know what? These guys got it going on, I thought, as a kid. Because they're always like mellow and they never get freaky. And so I remember the first time I smoked pot as a young guy. And uh, I remember how I grabbed onto it. And I, my dad had punched me in the face and swollen my eye shut and, uh, for no reason. And I, you know, all, all of a sudden I, smoked, I got high and the burning hatred I had for my dad inside just like chilled out. And my eye didn't hurt so bad. I remember turning to the guy I was with, Jason. I wasn't even old enough to drive yet, but he was. And I turned to him as a neighbor guy. I'm like, dude, you know, he rolled with his big Cheech and Chong green weed doobie and we'd smoked it down to the roach. And I'm like, man, where has this stuff been my whole life? And I just grabbed on so tight that day, and I stayed high for the next 20 years, literally every single day. There was probably, in that I'm not exaggerating, in that 20 years, there was only days that I didn't get high. Guaranteed, just a handful of days that I didn't get high in the next 20 years. I stayed high for the next 20 years because I used it like medicine. I used it like medicine. You know, people have depression, they get these antidepressants. That's what I was doing. It was a type of antidepressant. You know, and there's so many people addicted to drugs and alcohol, and that's what they're doing. They're just using it as medicine to try and kill the pain inside, and that's what I was doing. But I didn't realize it was just a cheap, crappy substitute that didn't work. It would last, you know. The, only as long as the buzz would last is how, good you'd, how long you'd feel good. So i get high on the way to school. Pretty soon by lunchtime, i got to catch another buzz, you know, and then, and then I'm getting high in, in Woods class. I'm getting high in Auto Shop class, and I'm selling quarterbacks because I, I was... In Wisconsin in the 80s, we had this cheap, the cheap brown weed that was coming from south of the border out of Mexico, and it didn't have much THC level. And pretty soon, it wouldn't get me high anymore. So I had to get good green weed to get me high. Hydroponics was a new thing, and so I'm getting this hydroponics weed that I couldn't afford, so the only way I could have it was to sell it. So I was the guy at my high school selling the good green weed when everybody else had junky brown weed, and so I got the good weed that I can get high on, and I'm able to have mine for free. And, you know, I'm everybody's, like, buddy, you know, and I'm catch, catching everybody a buzz, and I always got a big fat sack in my pocket. And uh, it's like, that's the way I did all the way through school to keep myself high. And so that's why I did it. You know, all my buddies, that's, I didn't, wasn't selling no kids at the school. It was all my friends and, you know, all the people that I knew. And, but it's never enough. That's why addictions always grow. I don't care if it's a food addiction, a drug addiction, pornography, sex Hunting, I mean, it could be golf. It doesn't matter. People have all kinds of weird addictions. It doesn't matter what it is. They always grow because they're never enough. You know, you know what? Shut your eyes right now. Just think about this. If you want to be convicted, listen to this. Anything that we like, love, trust, or desire more than God is an idol. Anything that we like, love, trust, or desire more than God is an idol. Your spouse could be your idol. Your house could be your idol. Your 401k could be your idol. Your golf bag could be your idol. Your Harley could be your idol. Pornography could be your idol. It doesn't matter. So right now, just right now, Lord, convict us. Show us anything that we like, love, trust, or desire, anything that we run to to make ourselves feel better, like a baby running to the little pacifier. Anything that we run to other than you, God, we just repent of it right now. We release it to you. We turn it over to you, God. We don't want idols. We want you. We want the real thing, the only thing that can quell the pain, the only thing that can heal, the only thing that can transform and change and make us into the men and women that you've called us to be is you and your presence and your power and your mercy and your grace and your love, and we just want it, God. We want more of you. So I had all these idols. I had all this stuff that I was running to, and I'm smoking pot all the time, and I'm drinking all that, and it's never enough, never enough, so then pretty soon I'm, I'm snorting coke, and I remember I was scared to get involved in it because I saw how it like really spiraled for some people. And sure enough, I got in it and I was like head into it and I'm selling that. And by the time I was 21, I had a cocaine overdose that should have killed me because I'm like, I couldn't stop. You know, like I'd buy an eight ball, I'd buy an ounce and split it up and then I'd keep an eight ball and I'd be like hiding out. It started out, I'm like partying with my friends at the bar and doing all this stuff, but pretty soon I'm like locked away in the attic somewhere by myself with blood running out of my nose, snorting line after line, all by myself, not sharing, grinching at all, just going for the line after line after line and just being miserable, like totally miserable and drinking my Crown Royal and, you know, just thing after thing after thing, trying to make the pain go away. 
just trying to make myself feel better. And instead, it just made it worse, not realizing it. So then Lori comes along, my wife, and I make her all these promises. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to quit selling drugs, baby, you know, and see what happened to her when she received Jesus. When she received Jesus, she's like, you know what? We get married. She's like, we need to start going to church. And I don't care what my mom and dad say because her mom and dad are atheists, right? She's like, I don't care. She says, we need to start going to church. I'm like, all right. You want to go to church? We can go to church. So we're going to church. And all of a sudden, she's on me, right? Like right away, we get married. She's on me. She's like, you need to quit. You need to quit smoking pot. You need to quit selling. I'm like, whoa, whoa, baby, time out. Just because you believe in Jesus now, I believe in Jesus. I can still smoke pot because I believe in Jesus. I mean, don't try and rain on my parade. She's like, well, you know, I don't think so. And so we're fighting and fighting and fighting. And I put that woman through hell. I prayed, God, send me somebody for, that would love me for the loser I was. And literally, she was the one because she should have never stuck around. That woman should have never stayed. I put her through hell for at least 10 years. Like, it was more than that. But the, like, the first 10 years were really hard. And so I'm just like, I made her all these promises, but then we got married and I couldn't follow through. I, I believe the reason why the divorce rate is the same inside the church as it is outside the church is this reason. We look to a husband or a wife, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and we put them up on this pedestal, and we think that somehow they are going to complete us and make us. And you know what? Marriage is an awesome gift. It's a great covenant from God, but they are not God, and they can't fill the shoes of God. And when we look to some person to make, complete us and make us feel whole and make us feel healthy, they are going to let us down every single time. Amen? They're going to let us down every single time, and that's what happened. She wasn't God, but yet I, I thought that she's going to somehow fix me. And you know what marriage is? It's two broken people coming together. Two sinners coming together. Now it's her baggage and my baggage. It's not just my baggage anymore. Now it's her baggage too. And we're trying to make this thing work, right? And uh, so all of a sudden what happens in the church and outside the church, what happens? This is what I did. I'm like, there's got to be something wrong with her. I thought she was going to like make everything cool, you know? I still need to get high. So what are you doing? There's got to be somebody else, right? Come on. There's got to be somebody else around here that can, you know, make it happen, make it work. Just come on, somebody. There's got to be somebody. Boom. I'm not happy anymore. Oh, I want a divorce in the church, outside of church, because we're expecting that person to be the end all. And they're not. I mean, I love marriage. Man, I, wouldn't, I couldn't imagine being single. I love my wife. I love my kids. But they are not God. And so I was disappointed because I thought that was going to, like, fix me, but it didn't. And so I'm looking for the next thing, next thing, next thing. And I had this thing in the back of my head. I had this six-figure number, and I decided as a young kid, man, if I can make that amount per year, I'm going to, like, because I grew up poor, I'm going to arrive. I'll, like, be somebody. And so God has a sense of humor. And I was, like, a functioning addict. I was Mr. Functioning Addict. I wasn't, like, without a job guy. I was, like, working hard, 12-hour days, 14-hour days, working my way up every place I worked. Still doing drugs and partying, but like, you know, sneaky, Mr. Sneaky, whatever, and uh, just doing it, and God blessed what I did, and I worked my way up, and at just under 30 years old, I was 29 and a half years old, I became the, the general manager, the boss of a multi-million dollar company in southern Wisconsin. I had 17 employees. I hired, I fired, I marketed, I did the whole thing. It was my deal. The only person above me was the owner, and I make this magic six-figure number that I think is going to, like, make me happy. And I remember I spent my 30th birthday, believe it or not, in Kelowna. I spent my 30th birthday in Kelowna because they had flown me in here to, uh, to visit the Western Star Truck Factory. There used to be a truck factory over in Kelowna. And uh, we were a Western Star truck dealer that I was manager at. That was one of the things we did. We had a lot of stuff, but that was one of them. And so they had flown me in there and wined and dined us, a whole bunch of us over there at that. And uh, I remember we were at the strip club in Kelowna and partying like that whole week. And... Uh, that's where I spent my 30th birthday, and I remember going back to that, uh, what is it, Okanagan, the, the big, tall, fancy place, whatever that real fancy hotel or whatever is there where the conference center was. The Grand, there you go. I remember going back there and, like, being so miserable. I'm having my 30, I remember the 30th birthday, that night of the 30th birthday over there, and I'm, like, so miserable because the money didn't make me happy. I thought the money was going to do it. I thought it was going to, like, fix everything, and all it changed was I quit selling drugs. I just quit selling drugs. It's all changed. At that point in my life was when I finally quit selling drugs. And uh, I, just, I just resigned to the fact that I'm going to be miserable and probably die from a drug overdose or die from a drunken driving accident because I was, you know, crazy and partying all the time. Just like I knew so many people and my friends already that had died. Like, I've got so many friends that died, overdoses and accidents and getting shot and all kinds of stuff. You, you live in that lifestyle long enough, you're not going to make it. I mean, things, bad things are going to happen. And so, I mean, I just knew all these guys, right? And I thought, that'll be me. Or like my dad, just be miserable like my whole life if I do live. 
And uh, so I would just resign to that. And after 20 years, God sent these two missionaries. So my wife, get this. Now check this out. My wife worked at a church from like our first year of marriage. And we're going to church every Sunday, and we're going to church every Wednesday. And pretty soon they make me like trustee, and I'm pretty soon I'm on the church council because we're this upstanding family, and we're giving thousands of dollars to the church. I mean, we're big, way above a tithe and uh, active, involved the church. Everybody looks at our family and think, oh, the perfect little family. But it's like it wasn't perfect at all, man. I was still totally head into, I mean, daily pornography use, smoking pot every day. At that point, I backed down to where I was only like, you know, snorting like an eight ball on like Friday and Saturday night or something like that. I might, you know, just do a little bit during the week. But drinking for sure Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know, that's where I was living. While going to church, people, as I give this a testimony, I can't tell you how many people come up. I've had pastors and deacons and elders, and they come up and they're crying and they say, I'm addicted to pornography, or I'm, I'm, on, I'm cheating on my wife, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that, and nobody in the world knows, but your message convicted me so bad, I want freedom, help me right now. It's rampant in the church, not just in, not just, not just in the pews, but in the leadership, because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's his job, and he's good at it, and he's sneaky, but the one who is in us is greater and stronger, and Jesus comes to set the captive free, and because he comes to set the captive free, my pastor knew I was a soft touch. And these people needed money for this thing in Africa. And so he, he says, you need to talk to these people. Basically, he wanted me to give them money. So we ended up, my wife and I gave them a minivan, and we filled it up full of clothes and toys and all this stuff, and we just packed it full. And they, you know, they come over, and they sign, sign the title over, and they're, they're getting ready to leave our house. And we had moved back to central Wisconsin, where we're from. And I quit, I quit working at that place where I was manager. And I started my own diesel repair business, back up in central Wisconsin, and I worked my way back up to that six-figure number that I wanted to make, and I'm up there, and I'm making everything. God has blessed everything. Everything's awesome, and uh, we, you know, we built a new house, and we got four, we had four kids in three years because we had twins in the middle, and so, I mean, I got this young little family, and everything's going great, and uh, these people come to the house, and we sign the title over and give them this van. It's, you know, they needed a bunch of stuff, so we, we this Africa thing, we give it to them, and they go to leave, and the, the guy's got his, uh, hand on the doorknob, and I'm sitting on my, like, black leather in the Tootsie couch, all kicked back, chilling, and, and, and we're like, yeah, see you later, and the guy's like, hey, man, can we, can, we do, can we pray for you guys for anything? Is there anything we can pray for? And I said, yeah, I've been addicted to drugs and alcohol for 20 years. I said, pray for that, and they're like, ah, oh, ha, 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 yeah, no, really. I'm like, uh, yeah, really, like, seriously, I've been addicted to drugs and alcohol for 20 years, pray for that, and they're like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. So they come walking over, and the wife gets to me first. I'm, I'm puffed, you know, down on the couch, right? She gets to me first, and she stands over me, and she begins to operate in the word of knowledge. Now, the church that I went to, there was no gifts of spirit. There was no spirit. It was a cessationist-type church, right? Denominational church where no spirit. And she's, this woman's standing above me, and she operating the gifts. And one of the gifts is the word of knowledge. And if you're here tonight, you don't know what that looks like. I'm sure most of you do, but maybe the, for the few that don't, this is the word of knowledge. How many people would believe that God knows everything? How many people would believe if you're Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? Right? If you're Christian and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and God knows everything, he can tell you things you wouldn't know. The word of knowledge. So she stands above me and she goes, about the time that you were five and six years old, you repeatedly repeatedly molested. And I look up this late, I'm thinking, wait a minute. The only person that knows this in the whole world is my wife. My brothers don't know this. My mom, nobody knows this. Nobody knows this. And I'm looking and thinking, my, my mind starts going, Zzz. how does she know that? Man, they're not even from our town. I'm looking at her like, how does she know this? I'm looking at this woman, and then she starts going on. She's telling me about my life, telling me about my mom, telling me about what my dad was like, about what it was like to grow up in my house. And she's just reading my mail. And the more she's talking, all of a sudden, like, the Holy Spirit's like, she's not talking. It's me. And, man, I started crying so hard. Like, snot is, like, running down my face. I'm, like, sucking wind. I'm, like, just, like, sobbing. I wasn't kind of crying. I was sobbing, like full on, full blown, just sobbing on the couch. And the woman goes, and besides that, you've been in drug and alcohol uh, counseling and all that, and it's all failed. And the reason why it's failed is because this is not a physical problem. This is a spiritual problem. You've had demonic oppression against you since you were a little kid that's in your house. And if you want to be rid of it right now, stand up and we're going to pray. And I jumped up off the couch and Lori was over at the kitchen sink. I said, Lori, get over here. And she jumps, and so we're in the great room of our house. So this room is this big, tall ceiling room, and the far end is all windows, like big trapezoids, and then a big eight-foot sliders. It's all glass on this end. 
and we're standing in the middle of that room, right dead center in the middle of the room, and they all of a sudden they go, because they had, we had our four kids are little, man, our kids are like little, and our kids are running around, and they had some kids, and they're like, before we pray, can we have the kids go in the basement? I'm like, what? What kind of people are these? They're making their kids go away when they pray, you know, that's kind of weird, and they're like, well, just, we just want the kids to go in the basement. See, at this point in my life, I didn't know what deliverance was, and I didn't, and I didn't know what it looked like, and I didn't know about anything that came with it, right? And I'm thinking, these people are weird, man, you know, so they, all the kids go in the basement. I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, so we're standing there, and I'm hanging on to Lori's hand, and I'm hanging on to the dude's hand, and the, the woman's over there, and we're just standing in the circle, we're praying, and they start, he started, I remember, he started first, and all of a sudden, I felt my wife, Lori's arm, starts going up and down a little bit. I'm thinking, that's kind of weird. Next thing I know, she's doing like this. And I'm, I'm having everything I can do to hang on to her hand. And I don't open my eyes. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, she is like so embarrassing me. I'm thinking, what is she doing? Like, I can't figure out what she is doing, man. Her arms are like flying all over, right? Because she's getting cleaned out, right? I mean, the, the rotor rooter is going through, right? And she's like flopping around. And she starts doing the crappie flop and going all crazy. And I'm like hanging on. Like, I'm not going to let go. I'm like, what is she doing, right? And, and then they turned it on me. And they started praying for me. And Lori and I both saw in the spirit the exact same thing, which is so crazy. Because the reason why I mentioned that we're in the great room, so I got this big, tall ceiling. And it's all wood paneling up there. And all of a sudden, both of us saw light and dark figures is the best way I can describe it. There wasn't detail. But light and dark figures, sword fighting above our heads. Like fighting, like sword fighting. We both saw it. I didn't even open my eyes. I could see it through closed eyes. I could see it. She kept opening her eyes, she told me, and she'd look, and she couldn't see anything. She'd close her eyes. She'd close her eyes and she'd see it. She'd open her eyes. She couldn't see it. She kept going back and forth trying to figure out what she was seeing, right? And so, so they're praying for me, and, uh, you know, they get done. And all of a sudden, it just got, like, super bright, like, super bright light, and when they finished, and all the, like, the fighting, like this, it all stopped, and it got bright white. And, I, and they, when they said amen, I opened my eyes, and I look up, and I'm trying to figure, like, did one of my kids come up the basement steps and flip on the light? Because there's this great big light up there, you know? And I'm trying to see if that light was on, and the light wasn't on, and I'm looking up like this, and like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, no, nah, nothing. And they're like, no, what are you looking at? I said, well, it just seemed like it got really bright, and they're like looking at each other going, oh, you know, laughing. I'm like, these people are so weird, you know? Like, what are they... You know, and they were, like, speaking in tongues and stuff. So, yeah. So, I knew that the, I had heard one other person in my life speak in tongues, and I had heard them speak in tongues. So, they leave. Get this. So, they leave, and I say to my wife, I'm like, hey, what do you think of that speaking in tongues stuff, huh? And I said, did you hear that? Yeah, that was pretty crazy, huh? And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, you know, fumble jumbo, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, she's like, what are you talking about? I said, you know, when he was praying, she was doing it. And when she was praying, he was doing it. She's like, no, they weren't. I, no, they weren't. I said, Lori, come on. Yeah. When, when she was, I said, and I kept, we start, we start arguing, right? We start getting a fight. I'm saying, Lori, they were speaking in tongues. I know they were. I heard them. You couldn't understand a word they were saying. She says, Bruce, when he was praying, she's saying the stuff like, we love you, Jesus. Jesus, come. All this stuff. She heard perfect English. She heard them speaking perfect, absolute English. So we're like fighting back and forth. We wait like 15 minutes, you know, and I'm like, we're calling those people. And we're going to give them like a couple hours to get home. We're calling them. So they get home and I get them off. I'm like, okay, for the record, were you guys speaking in tongues or not? And the wife's like, yeah, why? And I'm like, Lori, come here. And I like hand her the phone, you know. <laughs> and we get off the phone. She's like, what does that mean, you know? I think maybe she would have been freaked out. I don't know, but she got, like, the interpretation exactly. And she's, she said they're saying stuff like, oh, we love you, Jesus, and thank you, Jesus, and Jesus come, and, you know, all this stuff. It was so crazy. So I get set free. 20 years of drugs, alcohol, pornography, bam, boom, Jesus sets me free. And, like, life change. I'm already going to church. I'm already doing my little 10-minute devotional in the morning. I'm already going to church on Wednesday and Sunday and giving lots of money to church. But now everything's different. Now it's no more like one foot in the world, one foot in God. I mean, I believed in him. I believed he was real, but I didn't ever allow him into my, to fix the things that were wrong in my heart. I never allowed him to come in and fix the things that were wrong and clean up the baggage and break every chain. Where'd she go? And break every chain. That's like, that's one of my favorite songs. I have my kids, when I minister at the end, I usually have my kids, whether they're doing the worship, I like have them just loop that song up there behind me for like an hour to break every chain as we're praying, because there's power in that song. You know, even, and you know, I felt like when you were doing it, chains were being broken for sure. Absolutely. Like for real. So, 
so I get set free. Now everything changes. Like everything changes. Now I'm like reading my Bible for like an hour and a half before work because I can't get enough of it. And I'm going to church and I'm the guy that like the only person in place that's got my hands up because I'm like worshiping this Jesus that is in love with me. And I'm thinking, I'm such a loser. I don't deserve it. But yet he came to help me, right? He loves me, even though it's like so crazy. It doesn't even make sense that he would love me. So I knew that I'd always been called in the ministry. God had actually called my name in a church when I was 18 and a half. That girl that I broke up with, the weekend that we broke up, her mom and dad hated my guts anyway, and I, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes, then her mom and dad like, said they're going to disown her, and she was going to university, and they said, if you marry that guy, we're, we're not paying for university, and you're kicked out of our family. You're like, Sep, you know, we are like shunning you if you marry that guy, because they knew I was bad news. And besides, my, my dad and my last name, and they were like from the other side of the tracks, and he was a superintendent for the paper mill, and we were not, you know, and saw all this stuff, and... Uh, and, and so we're fighting at a University of Eau Claire. We're fighting, and I went to, she was like an hour and a half away, and we fight this whole weekend. I was there, so she stayed in the girls' dorm first year, like freshman, you gotta stay in the girls' dorm. So I'm gonna sneak in there and like sneak and spend the night, Saturday night. So we fight all day Saturday, and I get to the end, I'm like, you know what, forget it. I'm just driving home, I don't need this. Give me the ring back, we're done. If you don't love me and, and you're gonna take your mom and dad's money instead of me, then forget it, we're done, you know? And she's like, well, just quit selling drugs and doing drugs and partying, and maybe mom and dad will, will like, let you into the family. I'm like, no, if they, don't love me, if they don't love me for who I am, you know, blah, 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 right? So, yeah, that sounds familiar, right? So we have this big fight, and, and I'm leaving, and she's like, okay, well, I'm literally in the parking lot, and I'm getting ready to get in my Trans Am. She's like, you know what? All right, here's the deal. She said, I'll make a deal with you. She said, you can spend the night in the dorm. We'll spend one last night together, but, and we won't fight. We'll just drop it. And in the morning, you've got to go to Mass with me. They're Catholic. She goes, you go to Mass with me, and then I'll give you the ring, and you can leave, and it'll be done. And I'm like, all right, you are not going to fight. Or, you know, everything's going to be normal tonight, like it always is. And then in the morning, I'll leave. She's like, yep. So we make this deal. You know, we spend the night. We get up in the morning. We're going to the church. We're walking across the campus. We get to the church. We're like, I don't know, 150 yards away from the church, and we're in the sidewalk. And the closer I'm getting to the church, like my hair starts standing on the back of my neck. We're getting closer to church, and I start feeling the presence of God, like, stronger with every step. And I stopped on the sidewalk, and I said, I'm not going in there. I'm not going in there. I said, I'm just leaving right now. And she's like, you promised. You promised. We spent the night there last night. You're going to that church. That was mine of the deal. You're in the deals. You're going to that church with me. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to that church. So we're standing there. We're arguing in the sidewalk, and I could just feel the presence of God. And I felt naked. It's the only way I can describe it. I felt like all my lies about addictions and all that stuff. Everything was just like, we're stripped away. And God doesn't condemn. God is not a God of condemnation. The devil condemns. God is not a God of condemnation. He's a God of conviction, though. Some people, there's a, there's a movement in the church body today that says that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict. That's a lie. That is not biblical. That is not the truth. The truth is God does guide us, direct us, and part of that is conviction. That's saying, this is good, that is bad. Do this, don't do that. That's what conviction is. The devil says, you're a loser, you can't be saved, you can't be helped. That's not God. God is, you know, I love you. Don't do this. I've got better than that for you, right? You get this. So that's what he's standing there telling me. And I'm, and I'm like, I don't want to go in the church because I can feel it so strong. And she like drags me up that, I'm like dragging like a mule up that, up that sidewalk. And we go in that church and we sit in the back. And I want to sit right next to the door, as close to the door as I could. And we're sitting right in the back, right by the door. And... Um, there was one row of seats behind us, and there was people. They got there before us. And so the back row was taken. So I had to sit in the second back row, but I was right on the end towards the exit. And we're, we're standing up. We're singing this hymn. and singing this song. And I remember right where my eyes were on the page, we're standing. And my, it was like, you know, the stanzas. I'm getting to the end of the stanza, and my eyes were going from here to here on the page. And all of a sudden, God calls my name out in that church so loud that I thought the church was going to collapse. Like, literally, I thought the church was going to fall down, and I jumped like a cat, and the hymnal goes flying out of my hands, right? It goes flying, and I'm like, I turn around, and I look at those people right behind me, because I'm looking like, where did that, you know? I knew, I knew that I, I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God, but I, want, I didn't want to believe it, you know? So I'm looking, and the people that are standing behind me are looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy, right? And Jeannie is looking at me like, what are you doing, Right? And all of a sudden, I'm like, nobody else heard that? And that's what I'm thinking. Like, nobody, it was so loud, nobody else heard that? Are you kidding me? How is that even possible? And my mind's like, Zzz. And it was crazy because they say a picture can say a thousand words. <laughs> One word from God 
Just my name was like 10,000 words. He downloaded so much stuff. Boom, 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 boom. It was just like, bam, all at once. And then like it was, Bruce, I love you. Bruce, you're my son. I can believe that. Bruce, I've got plans for you. Bruce, Bruce you're going the wrong direction. Stop, you're going to get hurt. You know, don't mess this up. Boom, boom, all this stuff, all this stuff. Boom, 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 boom. And the last thing was, I've called you to full-time ministry. Go to Bible college. And I, I stood there contemplating everything. And when I got to that one, I'm like, did he forget my last name? No way. And I ran out of that church. I ran. I ran out of church. And that time, I was selling this pot that was actually coming from Hawaii. And I remember getting in the car and, like, any pot smokers here, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like steering with my knee, and I'm smoking bowl after bowl for like an hour and a half back home. Bowl after bowl. And like you could get high in like half a bowl of this stuff. It was like toxic weed. And I'm like, I was so high by the time I got back, but I couldn't make it go away that God had called my name. I couldn't make, no matter how high I was, my eyes are like, mm, you know, and I could not make it go away. God had called my name, and I'm like, Lord, why? No, I'm not me. I can't tell anybody about you because. I mean, I'm such a bad person, right? And that, who is that? That's the enemy. He holds us back. He holds us back by lying to us and saying, don't you tell so-and-so about God because look at you, you loser. Look what you do. I know about your skeleton in the closet. I know what you did, all this stuff. And it's just that little red guy on the shoulder telling us to shut up when the whole time God is there saying, you know what? That's under the blood. Amen, right? It's under the blood. That's forgiven. It's in the past. Go ahead, do it. Step out, do it, right? And so I listened to the little red guy. And uh, two years later, I have the massive drug overdose, and it almost kills me. And then it's like, you know, drunk driving accident, and this thing, and that thing. And like I said, we get married, and, and then after all that, after 20 years, God sends those people. I get set free, and everything's different now. And so what was holding me back was all my addictions. That was like what the devil used to, to stop me from telling people about God. And so I'd go to church, but I wasn't like talking about it or nothing, right? And so now I get set free, and we're like, I said, we're having small groups at our house. We're having Bible studies at our house. We're having people at our house. Whenever they want to come, they can come. We're going to talk Jesus, right? And so I get set free, and they didn't believe in deliverance and that stuff in my church. And God began to show me people that had demons on them in our church. And they would, like, come to me, or, or like, God had shown me. And I'm like, hey, you need to come to our house. And, like, somebody gave us this book, Pigs in the Parlor, right? Like, this old school. Yeah, how many heard of that book, right? Pigs in the Parlor. Like, old, yeah, a whole bunch of hands, right? So I read this book. I'm like, I can do this, right? This is easy. You know, we could do this. Jesus is going to do it anyway. So we're having people, and these deliverances are happening. People are getting set free and healed and delivered. And my pastor hears about it, and he's like, okay, uh, you can do it because he saw the fruit, right? He saw the fruit. He's like, you can do it at your house, but don't bring it to church. We don't want to talk about it. I don't want to hear about it. You, whatever you do there, I don't even want to know about it. It's like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Right? What happens at Venata's house just stays at Venata's house. Don't talk about it at church, right? And it was crazy, but all these people are getting saved, healed, delivered, all this fruit at our house, right? So this year goes by, and it was that end of that next year is when the accident happened. So it was November of 2006. It was November of 2006. Can, can I, like, bust off on a little rabbit story? You guys, like, getting bored? You want me to stop? Good? Okay, so November 2006 happens when the accident, what happened early in that year, so I'm set free, right? Everything's changed. And God says, go through the Bible. It was this old Bible. I've got like 20 Bibles, but this is the one I always end up using like. And uh, he says, go from Genesis to Revelation and write down every single time that I communicated with someone. Oh, it took me two years. It did. I have this notebook, right? And I'm writing down every time I'm doing it. And what I didn't realize when he told me to do it like halfway through, I realized, all of a sudden, they all began to fit into categories of the way he did it. So God communicated with people in the Bible what he showed me in that process. There was only seven different methods, seven different ways that God communicated with people in the Bible. And there were these seven categories, these seven methods. And so the Lord showed me that, and pretty soon I started putting the meth in the category. And that's what it was. And then he showed me how in my life, since I was little, he had been, he used all those seven ways, just like it did in the Bible. So then he says, write a book. God talks to everyday people, everyday dude, right? God talks to everyday people, are you listening? That's what the title was going to be. God talks to everyday people, are you listening? So I write this manuscript. I get it done right before the accident. I get it all done. And um, it was that summer, that summer of 2006. Like, I was having these crazy conversations with God. It was so like, so here's the deal. God wants our conversations, our communication with him to be a two-way stream. Right? It's supposed to be dialogue. It is not supposed to be monologue. It is not monologue. It's dialogue. And if you're a Christian, you're here tonight, and you're just getting monologue, and you can't say you hear God speak, 
It says in, in Corinthians, let every matter be established on two or three testimonies, or two or three witnesses, right? Let every matter be established on two or three witnesses. They couldn't put somebody to death in the Old Testament unless two or three people saw them, right? So Paul takes that and he says, you know what? Use this for life. Let every matter in the Bible be, let it be established on two or three witnesses. So that means you, there's 30-some thousand verses in the Bible. 30-some thousand verses in the Bible. You can take a verse, one verse out of context, and get it to say anything you want it to because there's so many. But you're not going to get two or three to do it. See it? But on the converse, on the flip side of that, you find two or three verses that say the same thing, you can, it's a precept. It's a principle in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Right? You find two or three verses that say the same thing, it means you can stand on it, you can believe it, you can take it to the bank. Let every matter be established on two or three witnesses. So some people say, well, God doesn't talk. Here's two or three. John 10, 27. My sheep know my... If, <laughs> right? If you hear that ver verse... And you say God doesn't speak to you, but Jesus said it. My sheep know my voice. There's a problem. Here's the, the one that like blows it out of the water, though. John 8, 47. Jesus says, it's in red. He who belongs to God hears what God says. Isn't that awesome? He who belongs to God hears what God says. So back to hearing from God. If you're not hearing from God, there's a problem, right? God talks to everyday people. Are you listening, right? It's not that he's not talking. It's that we're not listening or realizing for some reason. So... One of the places that I love to talk to God was in the shower. No phone, no TV, no kids, no dog, no wife, no nothing, right? There's like one-on-one -on -one in your birthday suit, one-on-one -on -one with God. I can sing, I don't have to worry about how I sound, you know, and just whatever. Just talk to God and expect to hear him talk back. Dialogue, two-way stream, right? So I'm in the shower, and over the period of the summer, God keeps coming to me and asking me straight up, will you die for the advancement of the kingdom? And every time he'd ask the question, I'd like freeze and not answer. Like, I can't answer that. I wouldn't say anything, right? So it's going on, it's going on. And at the end of the summer, I, I call up this buddy of mine who was a pastor out on the East Coast. He had, it used to be my pastor, see, at that Lutheran church. And I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and he was the associate pastor. And the senior pastor's like, I'm like, don't tell me, I don't want to hear nothing about it. And I kept telling the associate pastor, this young guy, like, man, this is happening, that's happening. You got to read this Pigs in the Parlor book, dude. And you got this Benny Hinn, Hello, Holy Spirit. And you got to read this book. And he's like, no, no, no. We didn't hear about that at the seminary. So I don't want to know nothing about it, man. You're, just, you're, you're freaking me out. And like, I said, yeah, but look at my life. Look what's changing, all this stuff. So finally, God gets him. And he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. And he can't stay at our church. He couldn't handle it. He had to leave. So he takes a call to another church on the East Coast. He leaves. I wrecked it for him. God wrecked it for him, right? So he goes away, and he's out in the East Coast, and now he's a good friend of mine. So I call him at the end of summer, and I'm like, man, God has been asking me if I would die for the advance of the kingdom. What do you think of that? And he's like, well, maybe it's like Isaac and Jacob, you know? And I'm um, like, actually, we talked twice. And the first time when I said that, the very first time I talked to him, and I said, God has been asking me if I would die for the advance of the kingdom, he says, Oh, Bruce, he says, you're like on the, the most on fire for God man that I know. He said, I know. You told him yes. Whoa, conviction, right? Because I hadn't told him yes. I hadn't said anything, right? So I like get off the phone real quick with him, right? And uh, so like a month goes by. I'm in the shower. I'm having this great conversation with God. I mean, like I am like he's standing right there talking, right? I'm hearing God talk. I'm hearing him answer. We're talking. And he says, will you die for advance for the kingdom? And then he says, by the way. Now, when the Holy Spirit says, by the way, to me, I'm getting taken to the woodshed, if you know what I mean. When he says, by the way, to me, it's his nice way of rebuking me. And he says, by the way, you've had all summer to, you've had all summer to think about this question. You're going to answer. You're not getting out of the shower until you answer this question. So I'm standing there, man, and I don't want to answer. I don't want to answer. And so we built our house. And when we built it, because we have six, we put a pretty big water heater in the house. But that day, the water heater was not big enough, right? Because I don't want to answer the question. So you know the, the role. I'm like turning the hot up and turning the cold off. Pretty soon the cold is off and the hot's all the way hot. And it's coming out pure cold because I don't want to answer the question, right? So I've got it cranked down away from me on the wall, hit, spraying on my legs. I'm all the way back as far away from the cold water as I get. It's spraying on my feet. I'm turning like the human prune. And I'm like in there for an hour. I'm like... I don't want to answer this question, you know. But I realized he said I couldn't leave until I answered the question. So finally I get down on my hands and knees in the shower, and I said, all right, Lord, I'll die for the advance of the kingdom on one condition. Now, 
that is not advisable to like make deals with God, right? <laughs> Maybe all those years of drug dealing, I thought I could make a deal with anybody. I don't know. And so I, I said on one condition, you son Lori, a replacement, a husband that will love her more than I do, and this guy has got to love my children more than I do. See, I grew up in a family where I had seen non-biological kids not loved as much as biological kids. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. If I'm going to die, and they're obviously so little, and she's pretty, and I mean, she's obviously going to get married, so uh, this guy's got to love my kids, not as much as me, more than me. And as soon as I said it, the Holy Spirit says, done. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, no, time out, right? I shut the water off, I cry, I get out of the, I get out of the shower, I, it's so master bedroom, I step out of the bed, bathroom, I'm, there's our king size bed, and I look at the bed, and the thought comes to me, some jerk is going to be laying in that bed with my wife, right? <laughs> I take a step around the corner, there's our, our walk-in closet, all my clothes are on the left, all her clothes are on the right, I'm thinking some jerk is going to have all his clothes on the left side of there, right? And then I looked outside our window, and there's this big window out in the front yard, and the kids happen to be playing out on the, on the swing set and stuff, and I, I'm, like, I'm like, oh man, some jerk is going to get to raise my kids, and they're awesome. And I'm like crying, I'm like, I can't tell Lori, so who can I tell? So I call that pastor back, and I said to Ryan, I said, man, I had the conversation with God. I said I'd die for the kingdom, and, and he said, done. And he's like, Bruce, it was just like, it was just like um, Abraham and Isaac. He said, you passed the test, man. It was just a test. It's a t I said, no, dude. He said, done. I said, I think I'm going to die. I think something bad's going to happen to me. He's like, no. He said, that's crazy talk. He said, dude, nothing's going to He said, nothing's going to happen to you. And I said, look, Ryan. I said, if I die, if something happens to me, call Lori. And you're the only one I've told. Call her and tell her we had this conversation. And not to feel bad, there's a replacement on the way. And he's like laughing. like, oh, that's crazy, dude. I'm like, Seriously. I'm serious. Tell her we had this conversation. There's a replacement on the wall. So he's like, oh, that's crazy. So a month goes by. I'm working on this logging truck. I own this business where I did on-site diesel repair. And so I, I didn't change tires. I didn't change oil. I specialized in diesel runnability and overhaul so I could charge more per hour. So I had this big service truck with all my tools on it, and I would go all over the state doing this. And so this day, I'm an hour south of my home in a place we call the lakes, and this big you know, big implement truck garage, this big Peterbilt truck is backed in the back of the garage, a big logging truck, and my truck is backed up to it, and uh, there's maybe eight to ten feet between it, and I was called in because this, it was a conventional. It's a long nose, it has a hood, big truck with a hood, right? So the hood's open, and I was called in because this Caterpillar diesel engine had a coolant leak, antifreeze leak, and so I had to change the head gasket and cylinder head. And so I get the job done, and the guy that I was working with was the driver slash part-time mechanic for this company. And so he, because I charged so much per hour, they didn't want me there very much. I mean, they just want me just to do what I'm going to do and get out of there quick, right? So they'd have me work with people usually at places. And so this, he was my, like, helper, and he cleaned the parts and get the tools and get stuff, right? And so there was stuff he could do. This guy could do stuff because he was, you know, part-time mechanic there. And so he helped me on the job for the three days. And what I, so a backup Tuesday when I started the job. I started the job on Tuesday. When I got home Tuesday night from work, when I, when I, taking the truck apart on Tuesday. I got home so late, my kids were already in bed, and my wife saved me a place of supper, and she sets it down in front of me and heats it up in the microwave, you know, and sets it down, and, and it's just me and her at the kitchen, and she starts getting this crazy conversation. And she's saying, you know what? We need to just sell the business and go into full-time ministry because we've been having all these Bible studies at the house and everything, right? And she says, you know it, and I know it, and everybody that knows this knows it, and everybody says we're called to ministry. And she says, you know that we need to do this, and you're being disobedient. We're being disobedient and I, by not doing it. I'm just like, I'm ignoring her and ignoring her. And finally, we get in this big fight. And I'm like, just shut up. Just leave me alone. Just back off, lady. And she's like, you wrote the book. It's going to come out. I know it's going to sell. And I said, you know what? Well, if the book sells and if it does good, then maybe. I said, but no, I just, where's the money going to come from? And she says, you're such a hypocrite. And I don't know about you, but the only thing that makes me mad I'm going to fight is when somebody pulls out the truth, right? I'm like, what do you mean I'm a hypocrite? And she says, I hear you telling people all the time at the house, have faith in God, have faith in God, have faith in God. She says, but you don't have faith in God for our finances, and that's why you won't go into ministry. So, like, I slam my fist. I try to pull a power play. I slam my fist on the table. I'm like, shut up. Just drop it. Just leave me alone. She's like, please, don't go back to work tomorrow. Please, just stop tonight. We'll just call it quits from this day forward. We're in ministry. We're in God's hands. Just stop. I'm like, no, just shut up. Leave me alone. You got a money tree out there that I don't know about? Who's going to pay the mortgage? Who's going to pay the, 
insurance, you know, just shut up. You're talking crazy. She stands up, puts her finger on the end of my nose, like, like right this. And three times she goes, Bruce Fanata, what is it going to take for you to be obedient to God? She says it three times, goes in the bedroom, bam, slams the door. Two days later, I'm working on the truck. The day that I had started the truck on Tuesday, I finish it up Thursday. It's 6, 10 p.m. I get it running. It's, it's not totally back together, but my part is done. This dude can finish it up from there. So I'm, I, I left at 6. It's now 6, 10. I got to ride home thinking, man, you know, I'll get home, eat supper. I'm not, I'm just like, I'll be out of here in five minutes. It's running up the temperature, making sure that I test in my repair so the engine is running in the truck to make sure it's no longer leaking. And this dude comes up, the guy I was working with, Leonard, he's like, hey, before we go, he said, man, I'd just like you to look at one more thing. I'm like, what is it? And he says, I've got this dirty spot on the engine. He said, and I wipe it off, and within, you know, a couple weeks, it comes back. He said, so it has to be seeping oil somewhere. And he said, but it doesn't drip out. I don't have to add oil. He said, it just makes a dirty spot. He said, so can you diagnose it? And he said, if we have to order a gasket or seal or whatever, I'll bring you back, you know? I'm like thinking, it's going to take me like two minutes. I said, where is it? He said, the front engine towards the bottom. So for those of you who've never looked underneath a big semi-truck, picture the big front bumper across the front, right? Yeah. Big front bumper in the front. Just a little bit of space to go underneath the bumper. And if you were to get on your knees, if you, if you were to get on your knees and look underneath the bumper and look towards the back, you'd see the lowest thing to the ground is the front axle. And the reason why is because it's a dropped axle. And all that means is this. Here's your two front wheels that move when you turn your steering wheel, right? Out of those wheels, the axle connects and drops down on both sides. Just like that. That's all. It's just, that's why I call it a dropped axle. And between the bottom of that axle and the cement, depending on the truck, depending on the size of the tires, depending on the axle, it varies how much space is between the bottom of that axle and the cement, right? And so a big dude cannot go underneath that axle on a creeper. They got to go around it. A little guy like me, most of the time I could slip underneath it. And this truck, I could slip underneath this axle. But what Leonard had done was he had jacked up that axle. The axle is about this wide, front to back. And it's shaped like an I-beam. And this truck had uh, five to six tons. So 10,000 to 12,000 pounds of weight on the two front tires. Not the weight of the truck, but just on the two front tires where they're touching the ground, five to six tons of weight. He had jacked up that axle on the passenger side and removed the front wheel so that we could get in next to the engine with the engine hoist to lift off the engine. So he had jacked it up on that side with a jack. So it had been on the jack for three days. The engine had been running for 15 or 20 minutes. I get on his little junky plastic hollow core creeper, which is an important part of the story, and I slip for feet first, lay on my back, feet first underneath the truck, underneath the axle, and I stopped and I said to him, hey, jump up inside and shut it off. If it's up to 180 degrees, shut it off. I go underneath. Now the axle is this wide, and it's, I stopped when it was right above my belly button. And it's just like an inch above me. The jack is holding it up over here. He gets inside the truck to shut it off. The truck shifts like it normally would. And I see movement in the peripheral vision of my left eye. And I turn my head down just in time to see the jack that's holding up that axle fly out like a rocket. And that axle crashes to the cement and comes down across my midsection like a blunt guillotine and crushed my body in half. So when it fell across me, when the axle fell across my, my belly, it'd be like, kind of like if you took your toothpaste tube and took the cap off and set it on your bathroom floor and did that, stuff is going to fly out, right? And that's what happened. On impact, stuff, sh blood, shot, blood and guts shot out of my mouth in a blob, like when it fell on me, and it just went blop and landed, like right here, it was about the half the size of a golf ball. And I called out and I said, Jesus, I said, Lord, help me. And I said it twice. I think the reason why I said it twice is because he had come when I was five, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, come and hug me, and he did. And then when I was 35, and those people came and prayed for me, I got set free. I think that's the reason why I said it twice. I'm not sure, but I remember saying two times, Jesus, help me, Lord, help me. And then I looked down, and when I looked down, this is what I saw. On the left side of my body, so the axle's touching the cement, and it's coming up at an angle because the driver's side wheel is still on, but I am a little bit to the, like, just about center to left to center underneath the truck. It's falling down. And there's about an inch of airspace right here on the side of my body between the bottom of the axle and the cement. So I know I'm an inch thick. Like, I know my body is an inch thick. And that, thank God, I was on that cheap little junky creeper because it flattened out to nothing, like eighth inch thick, like just collapsed because it was a hollow core plastic thing. It just flattened out to nothing. I had this, you know, I got my $300 snap-on really sweet creeper on the truck. And, it, and if I would have been on that, it would have sheared me. Is what I'd done. It would have sheared me instead of... Because it, it wouldn't have collapsed. So it collapses. I'm an inch thick here. I look to this side, and I'm about two inches thick. The widest part of the middle of my body is about two inches thick. 
Somebody here tonight might be going, ah, the dude's exaggerating. No, I'm not. Proof is in my radiology reports. My back, my vertebrae were broken the width of the axle. I was thinner than my spine, the width of the axle, right, in the middle. So, and especially even thinner than that on this side because it's touching the cement right here. I mean, it's literally touching cement right here and coming up at an angle, right? And so my back is broken. My vertebrae, the lumbar were snapped. And according to the radiology reports, the vertebrae were spider cracked, just a slightly little D-shaped. <laughs> Chafed into my spinal cord. The doctor said another 16th of an inch, I would have been paralyzed. As it was, I had to learn to walk again the year I spent in the hospital. So it's got me pinned down. And the guy goes into shock, and he freaks out, and I'm saying, please, call 911, please call 911. So he goes, and he calls 911, and then he gets the jack, and he jacks the truck up off me. And when he did, this is what I saw. My work uniform went like this. It went down, it went flat, and it came back. And I thought, as I looked at myself like that, it's like, this looks like something straight out of a cartoon. That's exactly the weird thought. This is like something out of a cartoon, like Wile E. Coyote gets run over by Acme truck, and he's flat across the middle. That's what this looks like. And I'm thinking, there's, it was so surreal. It was so weird. It was so crazy. I'm like, I should not be able to look at myself like this and still be like looking at myself and be alive. Like, it shouldn't be able to even happen. So I'm like panicking. I'm obviously going to shock. I'm in intense, crazy, crazy pain. And so I'm begging him, get me off running the truck because where he had jacked it up was on the spring. The spring is curved, and I thought the jack is going to slip again. But most people have been told, you don't want to touch someone if they've got a back injury, right? And so he knew I had to have a broken back. Like, I'm literally, like, flat across the middle. So he wouldn't touch me. So I reached back, and the big chrome bumper is just back here behind my head. And I grabbed the bottom of the chrome bumper, and I was able, and the, the creeper's broken, right, like this. And I just dragged myself out this far. And it took everything I had. I remember my, it was a short sleeve uniform, and my uniform slipped up, and I was watching my arm, like, shake and bounce like crazy. And by watching myself do that, I was thinking, dude, I'm like, I could do, like, 25 sit -up pull ups like, no problem. And I was watching, like, my arm shaking that bad, and I was thinking to myself, it's just one pull-up is all this is, and I can't even barely do it, and it's taking everything I've got. And I was so scared, thinking, that's it, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I pulled myself out, and, like, this much is now sticking out from underneath the front bumper. Like, the rest of me is underneath the truck. This much is sticking out from the front bumper. First responder was driving by. Volunteer fire department. Because we're out in the boonies, like out in the nowhere, right? Volunteer fire department. The first dude shows up. The second guy gets there. They're asking me, you know, like, whatever. I'm barely able to mumble. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm listening. And it's weird because we've, since we've been in our mother's womb, we've heard our heartbeat, right? It's just back there. And you never think about it. It's just back there. But when it stopped, I heard it stop. It sounds crazy, but it stopped. I heard my heart stop when I bled out. I bled to death. And at the point of death, I can say I died. They said it. At the point of death, my spirit left my body and went up on the roof of the garage. And I just now watched from above, like, wait, like that high. I'm just watching the whole scene from above like this, looking down. And Leonard, the guy I was working with, I'd known him since I was like 12. He's on his knees. He's running his fingers through my hair. He's crying. He's apologizing. He's saying he's sorry. He's saying stuff like, I should be the one that's dead, not you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, he's saying all that. And I'm up here watching in perfect peace, like amazing, amazing, perfect peace. Like it felt so good. My wife and kids get scared when I say this, but I can't wait. I literally, I can't wait till it's my turn to like really go because even though I didn't even get to experience heaven, man, like 15 feet up, out of this flesh bag was so awesome. I mean, I seriously, I can't even wait. It's going to be so awesome. If you had a Christian friend or loved one die, don't you dare be sad for them. You can be selfish and sad for yourself, but not for them. <laughs> because that's why they never want to come back. All the people I've talked to that died and experienced heaven and they get sent back, they never want to come back. So I'm just watching from above in perfect peace. I didn't, here's the weird thing. I didn't realize that that poor slob underneath the truck was me. Maybe that's part of the reason why I was in so much peace, right? I didn't know that was me. I'm just watching it all happen, and because it really wasn't me, because the real me is my spirit. Our body is just an envelope. Our body's just an envelope, and in the envelope is the important thing. Like when you get your paycheck and envelope, in the envelope is the important thing, right? Our spirit. And the real me is just watching from above, and that poor slob down there, he's dead, but there's... And so I'm listening, to, I'm listening to Leonard, and he's crying, and it didn't, I could care less. I'm just watching. But all of a sudden, it's like my view widened out, and I realized there's an angel on each side of my body. And Leonard is about six foot one or six foot two. And he's on his knees. One of you guys six foot one? Okay. Somebody six foot one? Six foot one. Okay, six foot one right here. You're Leonard. Leonard's on his knees above me, face them. 
the front of the truck, the hood is shut, big chrome bumper. He's running his fingers through my hair, and on each side of him is these angels on their knees, just like Leonard was, just like Leonard was, but their heads on their knees. Their heads were like two feet taller on their knees. Their heads were like two feet taller than his. And I'm watching from above. Their heads are like up here, but they're on their knees. And their shoulders, I mean, he's a big dude, but you know what? Their shoulders are like this, like up here though, right? Their shoulders are like this. And they got white robes on that are emanating light. They're just like glowing light. And they got their hands like this. The guy from the driver's side, he's got his hands down right in the middle where I'm crushed flat. The one from the pass side, matching bookend. Hands in the middle, right where I'm crushed flat. And I'm like way back here, but way up in the ceiling. I'm looking down at an angle like this, like way up looking down. And they never moved. They never talked. They never like communicated. They never looked at me up in the ceiling. They just had their hands right in the middle where I was crushed flat. I never got to see their faces, unfortunately, because I just, all I could see was their backs, just like Leonard, and their face in my body, but they had long hair. Their hair went to like here, like they had a belt on their robe. So there's like 300 times that angels are mentioned in the Bible, like 290 sometimes angels are mentioned. Sometimes they look like normal people. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have wings. Sometimes they don't. These angels didn't have wings. They look like normal men, other than the fact. Now picture, they're on their knees, but their heads are like two feet taller than Leonard. And they got these big shoulders, and they got these white robes that were made out of this crazy material. It's a little detail, but it's stuck in my mind. It looked like miniature rope. It's the best way I can describe it. It looked like miniature rope woven together like in a sack weave, like a potato sack, like a burlap sack, like just a simple cross weave pattern like that. But it was thick, so like the robes were like thick. And their hair went at an angle, they had long hair that went down and ended right where their belt was on their robe. You can sit down, thanks man. And it went right, it went right to where their belt was on their robe and they, they're like just like this. And I never got to see their faces, but it was obviously meant to say like these bulging muscles because the robes were tight and they're like back muscles and I mean they were like, like super beefy. Like God has to get these guys up there working out or something, I don't know. And they're like just like, like this. And all these people are like doing their stuff and it was really crazy because they're like working around the angels. The angels were like, Sid Roth did a reenactment, country music, television did a reenactment, History Channel, History Channel International just did a reenactment. All these reenactments they've done in Hollywood on my accident and all these places. The thing I don't like about them is they make the angels look like fuzzy or cloudy like you could see through them. They were not like that at all. They were just as real as the truck, just as real as Leonard, just as real as everything else. But they were like glowing light. I mean, they're like shining light. And they got their hands like in the middle of me and people are coming and going and they're saying, I'm dead, that guy's dead, I don't realize it's me. And they're just saying all this stuff, you know. And I'm just watching, I could care less. I'm just watching it all happen. And then I'm counting the people. For whatever reason, I'm counting the people. And then everybody comes in the main entrance. There's a big blacktop driveway and they all come in. But at the very end, these last two people come in the back door. Back door of the shop, there's a service entrance. And they come up the driver's side of the truck and one was this long red-haired gal. She gets down on her knees between the angels they're not even doing anything. They're just like, it's over. They're just like waiting. They had called med flight and ambulance and all stuff, but it's too late. You know, no, no heartbeat, no pulse. The reason why was I had five places that major arteries were completely severed. So I bled to death. That's what happened. I bled to death at the scene of the accident. So doctors, by the way, say that I'm the only person, not exaggerating, this is straight up truth. I'm the only person I can find in the whole entire world that has ever lived with five arteries severed. But at the scene, I'm dead, right? That's why History Channel just did a series, and they said that my miracle, History Channel, non-Christians, they were actually trying to disprove it, but they said, the producer of that show said to me on the phone, it's the biggest miracle that they can find in the world today, History Channel. They spent two years looking, and it's based out of Toronto. So I'm just watching it all happen from above, and, and it's a verifiable miracle, right? So I'm watching it all happen from above, and these angels got their hands in, my, in the middle, and this lady shows up, and she gets down between the angels, and she's checking for a pulse. And these two guys are over here that were saying it's too late, and they're saying, no, you know, it's done. And uh, she says to Leonard, who is now over here, she says, what's his name? And he says, Bruce Fanata. And she starts doing this. Bruce Fanata, come on, open your eyes. And I'm just watching. And when she says the name, it, it meant something to me, but I didn't know why. So I'm just like, why? You know, it's like I start, like, creeping down. I'm like creeping down, creeping down. And she's getting louder and louder. And what I didn't know was this. 38-year-old Shannon Celia is her name. Two-month-old baby Christian. Shannon Celia, two-month-old baby Christian. She's praying me back to life. Everybody's hearing her say, Bruce, don't open your eyes. But she's praying me back to life. And I'm creeping down and I'm creeping. Come on, two-month-old baby Christian prays a dude back to life? You kidding me? She, all of a sudden, 
bam, I'm back in my body, my eyes open up, and I'm looking at this chick face to face, like right there. And the first thought, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is the first thing that came to my mind. Oh, blank, I'm the guy underneath the truck, right? And the next thing was, oh, man, crazy pain. I felt like a truck had fallen on me, right? I mean, it's like this crazy, crazy pain. So I just shut my eyes. I just shut my eyes. My heart stopped again. Boom. I don't go back up the ceiling. At a 45-degree angle right here is a tube, a tunnel. And way, way at the end is this big, bright light. And I just, and I'm just like taking off an airplane. I'm going in that tunnel towards the light. And somewhere back here, as I'm flying away, somewhere back here, I'm hearing Shannon going, Bruce, Bruce Veneta. And all of a sudden, bam, I'm back in my body, open my eyes, heart starts again. I'm looking at someone, it's like, oh, it hurts too bad. Close my eyes, boom, goes back and forth, back and forth. And every time she said my heart would start, heart would stop. Every time I was eyes open, heart had, open, heart had start. And all of a sudden, I, I'm back in, and it's hurting so bad, and the God says to me, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, this, I love God, he never lies. He says, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. See, Jesus says in the Bible, in this world you'll have trouble, tribulation. It's kind of weird. It actually means, when you look it up in the Greek and the Hebrew both, it means like getting squished in a wine press, Right? You have trouble, you have tribulation like you're getting squished. I got squished, right? And he says, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. See, what I didn't know that night, that I was going to spend the next year in the hospital. What I didn't know that night, I'd have five operations. What I didn't know that light, night, I'd spend the next year after that in rehab. What I didn't know that night was there'd be days when I was in the hospital so sick and in so much pain after I came out of my coma that I would be hiding somewhere in the corner in the room begging God to just let me die. Please, God. Take me. I can't take it. It hurts too bad. Let me die. Let me die. Let me die. Please. He knew all that. So he says, you want to live? You're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. See, some TV evangelist or some dude might get up and say, oh, become a Christian. You're going to be an overnight millionaire, blah, blah, blah. Become a Christian. All your problems are going to go away. That's crap. You know what? Jesus said, in this world, you have trouble. You have tribulation. And sometimes the crap hits the fan, and you get stinky, right? And so I'm laying right there, and he says, you're going to have to fight. And I'm like, you know what? Don't want to do it. I shut my eyes. I die. The last time, I'm shooting away. She calls me back. The last time, I come back in, and the woman says to me, Mister, you're on the verge of life and death. What do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I totally forgot. Like, the thought had never entered my mind that I had a wife, that I had kids. And all of a sudden, it's like, wake up call. I'm like, oh, my God. I've got Lori. I've got the kids. i got to fight for them. So I'm like, I'm fighting for them. So I keep my eyes open, and, like, they rush me in, and I get med and they the doctor's getting this fight. The trauma doctor's getting this fight at the hospital because they, like, take a CAT scan of me when I land at the helicopter. And they cut, they, before they cut me open, they take this CAT scan, and then they're arguing. I'm, like, getting scared because they're arguing. I'm thinking, man, I don't want my doctors to be, these doctors to be fighting. And it's like, I don't know why they're fighting. And I found out six months later why they were fighting. They told me, they came and visited me in the hospital. I was still, at that time I was walking with a walker, and this dude shows up with a memory stick from a computer. And he's like, follow me. And like, I'm with the walker. And Lori's carrying the ivy pole. And he plugs in and he said, I said, why are you guys fighting? He said, here it is. And he plugs in. And he said, when you got there, he said, we took the CAT scan. He said, these, these, and he's explaining us the CAT scan. He's showing us on the computer, but I can't read a CAT scan. It doesn't mean anything to me. And he's showing us what they mean. He says, these are the CAT scans of a dead body. This is a dead person. He said, but the problem was, your eyes were open and your heart was pounding like you're a 20-year-old kid running the marathon. So the CAT scans had to be lying. Obviously, it was a faulty image. But we couldn't figure out why it could be a faulty image because of the way it looked. And so I said, it, the doctor says, I said it was one thing. He said it was another. We neither one of us believed the other one. So we started fighting about our ideas. But we said we were both wrong. So what happens is I start dying on the table, literally. And when I go, I say, if you guys don't do something right now, I'm going to die. And I hadn't talked at all at the hospital. So when I said that, they went, and they looked at me, and they rushed me in, literally because I like, er, so they rushed me into the thing. They cut me open, and what they found was the CAT scans weren't lying. Everything that the CAT scans showed was exactly what it was. All the arteries severed, spleen severed, pancreas severed, all the intestines scrunched, everything. Everything here crushed to nothing. It was mush. So they like hook up the arteries. They put blood in me. The head doctor at the trauma center gets called in. He finishes up the operation. He's the doctor that's called in when the president of the United States comes to Wisconsin. The best doctor we have. Best doctor. So what they do is they put a team together before the before president ever shows up, just in case something happens, they're ready, right? And so this was the guy when he was there. He's gone now, but when he was there, he was the guy. And he comes out and tells my wife, he's not going to live through the hour. I have never seen a body 
that traumatized ever and, and make it. I don't know how he made it here, but there's no way he can't live. And if he does live, he'll, have, um, he'll be a vegetable because he, there's no flow, and so his brain was starved for oxygen. And here's the crazy thing. They say if you have one artery severed, one, artery, one major artery severed, you got eight to 10 minutes before you bleed to death is what the doctors told me. Eight to 10 minutes, one artery. I had five, and it was two hours and 40 minutes from the point the truck fell on me until they operated on me. So that's why History Channel says it's the biggest, well, it's half the reason. It's the biggest miracle they can find, and it's totally doctor documented. They say which arteries were severed and all this stuff, right? So the doctor said, you know, he's not going to live, and if he does live, he'll be a vegetable and all this stuff and, and have brain injury and, you know, brain damage. And my wife says it's debatable. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So I end up, you know, spending this time in the hospital. I, 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 I end up, uh, they removed, every adult here has 18 to 20 some feet of intestine, small intestine. Adult, 18 to 20 some feet of small intestine. So mine was all damaged. And they sewed together uh, 106 centimeters. Is that 106 centimeters? Come on, metric people. A little more. So 106 centimeters, whatever 106 centimeters, like a couple feet, two and a half feet. Two and a half feet is what they were able to save, right? They were able to save that much. And then in February, part of the, one of the pieces they sewed together, they measured them. They said it was, one was like 70-something and the other one was, you know, 20-something. And they measured them and the, the 20-something died. So now I'm down to 70-some centimeters of intestine. Not enough to live. So they're feeding me intravenously and they say, you know, we find out I can only stay alive on 100% intravenous feeding. Year to year and a half is what they told us when I'm in the hospital. Because I get in this big fight with the doctor. When are you going to let me out of here, right? And he says, we're not, you're going to stay in here until you starve to death. So I go at the scene of the accident, 185, 190 pounds at the scene of the accident. By the February comes around, I'm down to 124 pounds. I'm wasted away. I look like somebody out of a concentration camp. You can see every bone in my body. I'm dying day by day as I'm starving to death, even though they're feeding me intravenously. So the piece dies. They, they, they cut it out. It's the fourth operation. They cut it all. Oh, lift up my shirt so you guys can see my scars. It might make it more real. So five operations. Rib cage to pelvic bone, five times they got me, right? So I got all these tubes. I had a J-tube, I had a G-tube, I had drainage tubes different times. The first week, they just kept me open, and they just operated a little bit every day, and just, they just had these clipper things, these snapped together metal player deals, and they just operated a little bit a day, and then they'd go the next day and do it, a little next day, and then after the end of the week, I had swollen up so bad for me and crushed, they couldn't even put me together, so they had to let the swelling come back down before they could sew me up. So anyway... I've got just this little piece of intestine left. I'm dying, and my wife's got me on prayer chains all over, and my buddy out in New York has got me on the prayer chain at his church, the dude who turned into charismatic. He's out there, and there's this guy at his church that God wakes up, another Bruce. God wakes up out in New York and tells him, wakes him up at 5 o'clock in the morning one day and says, the Lord tells him, buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin, pray for that guy in the hospital, and I'm going to do a creative miracle. And he like, man, I must have ate too much pizza before bed last night, right? That's crazy. And he tells his wife, he's like, that's crazy, you know? And so they like check it all on the computer. It's like a 950 bucks, 960 bucks for a ticket. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. There's, he's at a big church out there. People can pray for him out there. No distance in prayer, honey. Let's just pray now. So they pray, you know, whatever. Next morning, 5 o'clock, God says, buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin, pray for that guy, and I'm going to do a creative miracle. He obeys. He buys the ticket prays for me in the hospital. And what happens was, instantaneously, when he prayed, he puts his palm on my forehead. Now, so my church, they're showing up. They're praying, oh, Lord, please, God, heal him. Heal him, Lord. And they're crying, and nothing's happening. I'm sick, and I'm dying. And this dude shows up, and he prays like Jesus. Jesus said, speak to the mountain. Jesus said, speak to the mountain. He rebuked the fever in Peter's mother-in-law. He didn't say, Lord, please take away this fever. You know, God, Father, please. No, he said, I rebuked this fever, right? So this dude shows up. He puts his palm on my forehead. And he says, he speaks to the mountain, small intestine, I command you to start to grow back right now supernaturally in the name of Jesus. And when he does, electricity comes out of his palm of his hand into my forehead. And I feel like, I don't know if anybody here has ever touched an electric fence. But when you do, you hear it, you hear it as you get shocked. You hear the snap. You do. You hear a snap. I literally heard a snap of electricity. A snap. And I'm like feeling this electricity go right in. And I begin to feel my intestines going and I turned to this other guy on the other side of my bed, Brian, this guy from my church, who had driven the guy down, Bruce down, and I turned to him and I said, dude, it just felt like a snake came uncoiled inside my stomach. It's the only way I could verbalize what I was feeling, something cylindrical. So all of a sudden, my weight levels out, and my wife, you know, she's there, and I'm like sneaking, I'm, not, I'm supposed to be on like ice chips, 
And I can't even drink water, but I'd like take her water bottle and drink it. And, you know, like instantly would like come out. Like it would just like, psh. and then now when this guy prays for me, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. And so then they're like, okay, we're going to put you on like insure and these things. And I start gaining weight. And they didn't expect me to gain weight because I've got this little piece of intestine, right? 70, whatever, 70 some centimeters is. So I've got this little piece. They don't expect me to gain weight. So they expect me to continue to lose weight. So they say there must be a problem with your TPN. Your parental nutrition, you're, you're being fed. There's something wrong with it. we got to adjust the formula. So they start checking my blood and checking my stuff, and they can't figure it out. And they're like, you must be retaining water, but they, it doesn't, there's no water. And they're like, something's wrong. There's something's wrong. And so they go and they do this upper GI, and the radiologist, the dude, he's got me, i got to drink the bad stuff. I don't know anybody's he's ever had upper GI, but you got to drink this barium stuff. Oh, yeah, I so I drink it, right? And it's like nasty, right? And they like, you got 40 minutes, right? And they're doing it, and the guy's getting it, and he's like, he's doing the thing, and he's looking at this big screen, and he's looking at it, and he's scratching his head, and he, he calls somebody, says, I need the records, and he's flipping through these binders, because my binders were like this thick. I had two of them like this thick. And because I've been in the hospital for, at this point, a, a long time. I ended up in the hospital a year. And so he's looking at my stuff, and I hear him say, some other guy comes in, I hear him whisper to the other guy, there's been a mistake. I'm like, whoa, 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 time out, buddy. What kind of mistake? What are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm like, ha, no, no, no. It's my body. If there's been a mistake, I want to know exactly what kind of mistakes in my body, right? He's like, no, there's no problem in your body. He said, there's a mistake in these records. And I said, why? He said, because they're showing you only got like 70-some centimeters after they removed out of the piece. He said, but you got several hundred centimeters of intestine here. He said, we can see it. He said, but I don't, I don't know why. He said, but it doesn't make sense because Dr. Michael Schur, the head guy, is your doctor, and he doesn't make mistakes. I mean, and, they, and there was a team of five doctors, and they recorded. They've been in you four times, and they've recorded every time. And the fourth time they remove this, they say what you got, but it's like hundreds of centimeters off. So we just can't figure out why they're wrong every time they did an operation. I'm like, ding, I know why, right? So what's cool is it's proven by CAT scans, x-rays, and doctor's reports because I had to have five operations. I had one more operation after the creative miracle happened. I had a rib that never grew back. They thought it was going to stick, but it never stuck. So it was just flopping around making noise. And my gallbladder got wrecked from the parental nutrition. See, and that's why you can't live because it'll eventually, if you're on 100% parental nutrition, it eventually kills your liver, they told me. And it starts with your gallbladder. And so it wiped up my gallbladder, and they had to remove that. And it did a little bit of liver damage, but... And I had done a lot more liver damage before in my own life. But so, so the doctor, Mr. Schur, at the fifth operation, he's got to go in there and he's going to remove the rib that never grew back. He's going to remove the gallbladder. He's going to remove some uh, scar tissue. He had like these five like cleanup things. And it was a year after my accident. It was like almost on the date of my accident, I have the last operation, right? So I was told by the nurse and one of the other doctors in the room that he cut me open. And he had heard what the radiologist said about this intestine that magically appeared, he's like, yeah, whatever, right? Because he's an atheist, right? The guy doesn't believe in God. So he's got me cut open, and they said, this is what they told me, that when he cut me open, and he saw with his own eyes all this curled up intestine that he had removed, and it wasn't there, and now it's back, right? Like half of it is back. Then he threw the scalpel across the room and began to curse and swear, and he walked away from my body and stood and faced the wall and just swore and just stood there and calmed down gathered himself and came back and then proceeded with the operation. So obviously the guy hates my guts. <laughs> See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. He is a medical genius, they call him. And he actually, God gave this guy so much wisdom and so much knowledge from him, God-given, I believe. And this guy did stuff in me that had never been done. He did an operation he guinea pigged me. We found out later. 700 Club, when they did my story and they looked at all, they want to see all the medical records and they look at all. They told me later, did you know that he did this? See, my duodenum was gone. I had, my duodenum was totally missing. And somebody had written a thesis paper from their doctorate somewhere on the internet about how you could make a duodenum out of parts, like parts, and he did it in me. And all he told my wife was, this is what he told my wife. He drew a thing on the, on the whiteboard, she said. And, and he's like, you know, I've never done this before. All he said was he'd never done it. He goes, I've never done this before, but I think if we do this, 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 I can make a do a DM, we can do da, da, da. And she's like, well, if, if you got to do it, do it and whatever. And so he did it, not thinking that I was going to live. See, it was just a guinea pig thing, but it worked. And the 700 club is the one that caught it. And they're like, did you know he even did this? And you know, it's, it was like, it was a thesis paper. Somebody thought it might be able to be be able to be done, you know, and he did it, and it worked, and the guy had given this guy, like, crazy wisdom, and he's a really smart guy, and so, um, it's funny, when History Channel just interviewed him, History Channel just got done interviewing for my story, and now he, 
I found this out from the interview. It's, it's not, it doesn't come out on the interview. But they talked to him, you know, and not everything comes out on the interview. But they said that I told him that he was an atheist. And he said, well, I'm not an atheist anymore. He said, I'm an agnostic. <laughs> and so he says, now he believes that there's a higher power. He just doesn't want to name who it is, right? That's where he's, that's where he's moved to. But see, God was talking his language, right? God was talking this dude's language. So... I get this intestine back, and my, you know, God heals me, and my back that was broken, God ended up having somebody pray for me, the old Charles and Francis Hunter style, legs out, and I get prayed for, and my back gets healed better than it was before the accident. See, when God restores, he doesn't just go back to status quo, baby. He makes it better. You know what I'm saying? Right? He restores better. There was this dude, there was this, I just got to tell you this, I could talk all night, I'm sorry, but man, there was this dude from... There was this guy from Illinois that I prayed for that had been in a motorcycle accident 32 years before, and he had this crooked arm that they had removed three inches of his arm. George Chamberlain, uh, um, 700 Club's doing his story right now. And so I pray for this guy in this church at this AOG church in, in Illinois. He's the last guy to come up for prayer. He's got this little skinny arm. It's all atrophied away, it's just, and it's all crooked. They were going to cut it off, and he begged the doctor, don't take my arm, please. He was a young guy when an accident happened. He's like, please don't take my arm. And the doctor said, you're going to have a gimp arm. It's never going to work. And he said, we just should take it off. He's like, no, please don't take my arm. So he's lived life with a three inches shorter arm, three inches of bone removed. It's crooked. It's atrophied. It doesn't have any muscle. I pray for the dude. The guy goes home, and he lived right up the street, like literally right up the street from the church. And when I went to pray for him, he comes up, and he's like, I said, what's your prayer request? And I'm getting ready to leave. And he says, the Lord told me that I'd be the last person to get prayed for he was going to do a miracle for me. And I said, okay, what is it? And he puts out his arms. He had a, a leather jacket on. He, and I saw I didn't notice it right away. And he puts out his arms. And like one arm is straight and long. The other one is crooked. And then I could see it's skinny underneath the leather jacket. I'm like, oh, wow. Right? You know, whew, not good. And it's like, whew. We had seen in that meeting some, a 14-year-old kid with deaf ears get opened up. Two different locked shoulders get opened up. We had seen like a zillion miracles. But when I looked at that guy's arm, and I realized it had to be a creative miracle. Can you see between my fingers? That's how much faith I had, right? Even though what I just seen, like deaf ears open, all this stuff in that meeting. And I'm like, okay, dude. I said, I'm glad God gave you that word. So I just prayed for him. Nothing happened. And he leaves and he goes home. And he, all he did was drive home, got in his car, drove home, sat down on his couch and said, Lord, you said if I was the last person you prayed for, you're going to heal me. All of a sudden, bam, I am not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. On the spot. Three inches of bone comes back and all his muscle. So the dude is right-handed, but his left arm is now bigger than his right arm. And he's got custom-made suits. He was a printer, and he has custom-made suits that are three inches shorter. So when he gives his testimony, you know what he does? He wears his old suit and stands up, right? And it's like three inches short on the side. And it's all doctor documented, like totally creative miracle, people. Come on, right? Creative miracle. So, I mean, they, God does this stuff, right? God does this stuff. And so the doctor freaks out, and everybody freaks out, and we start the ministry, and, and I go and speak. The very first place I speak, in between my fourth and fifth operation, in, I, they let me out of the hospital for like two weeks, in between those operations, and I went and I spoke at that little bitty Lutheran church where I heard about Jesus that I told you about two hours ago, right? That little bitty church, it's the first place I get to minister. So I get propped up in the front. I mean, I can't stand. I'm all messed up, you know, and I'm, they got me sitting down in the front, and I tell the thing, and I say, the Lord came to me all year and asked me if I'd die for the answer of the kingdom. And now this accident happened, and I died, and he sent these angels, and now he gets all the glory. And they're like, oh, you know, yeah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and at that time, we didn't, know, we didn't know about the intestines for sure. It wasn't proven yet. Um, and so uh, I go home. And I had quit hearing from God. I like totally quit hearing from God. I, I was reading my Bible and I was like, I wasn't, I couldn't hear from him anymore because I was all this medicine. This medicine had me so cranked up I just couldn't hear the voice of God anymore. So I remember throwing a fit one day, and it was like a couple days after that I had spoke that week at, at that Sunday, and I was just about ready to go back to the hospital. I'm all bummed out, and I remember reading and I slammed my Bible shut. I'm like, God, why don't you talk to me anymore? Why don't I hear your voice anymore? And uh, and I'm just like venting, you know, like sometimes. You know, I'm just be honest. You know, like sometimes we get in a place where we vent, and I was like venting on God. And I'm saying, you know, why would you even send the angels? And I'm sick, and I'm miserable, and all this stuff. And I stay set at that point, you know, I'm still going to be disabled and all this. And, and still at that point. And the Lord speaks, and he says, remember our conversation in the shower. I'm like, I'm in this pity party, right? And it's like, what's that got to do with that? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And, and he's like, <laughs> God talks to us in our own language. And he says, I kept my end of the deal. And I'm thinking, oh, great. 
some dude is going to show up knocking on my door or something, right? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, great. Oh, like it can't get any worse from here, right? I'm already sick enough, right? I'm going to die. Why did you put me through this year of hell, right? I'm like freaking out. He's like, you don't get it. He says, you don't understand. What he said was, you don't understand. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, when you spoke this Sunday at that church, he said, you told them, I asked you if you'd die for the answer to the kingdom a lot. And he says, you misrepresented me. He said, don't ever say that again. Don't ever tell anybody that ever again. And I'm like, Lord, that's exactly what happened. You asked me if I'd die for the answer to the kingdom. I died. You sent the angels. You got this great testimony now. And he's like, you misunderstood the question completely. I'm like, Lord, you asked me if I'd die for the answer to the kingdom. I died. And he's like, no, you misunderstood the question. I'm like, Lord, show me. And he said, Bruce, when I asked you, Christians tonight, listen. He said, Bruce, when I asked you if you would die for the advance of the kingdom, I was asking if you'd die every day to yourself and every day to your desires and your dreams, and I was asking you to go to full-time ministry. And I sent your wife two days before the accident to beg you not to go back to work, to beg you to just go into ministry, but you wouldn't listen. Instead, you slammed your fist on the table and told her slash me to shut up. I didn't want the accident to happen. That wasn't my perfect plan. I knew what the enemy had planned. I was ready to stop it. I was, but you have to work with your free will. You have free will. You exercise your free will. You said no, the truck fell on you. Don't ever say that I caused the accident. Don't ever say that that was me because that was not me, the Lord said. See, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God didn't cause that accident. The devil did. God tried to prevent it, but I was too stubborn to listen. Right? I was just too stubborn to listen to it. If you're here tonight, and you know that God has called you to do some things and you haven't been obedient, I pray to God something bad doesn't happen. And it's not God. It's not him making it happen. But when this is what I look at. It like We got this umbrella of protection as a Christian, and we got free reign, and God, like, God is covered, and we got protection, and we're under there, and we're running around, and he knows we're going to sin, we're going to mess up, and we're covered, we're covered. But when we get in an area of disobedience, willful people, listen, when we get in an area of our life of willful disobedience and we decide about this certain thing, I'm just going to do this, and I don't care what you think, God, I think we can come out from underneath this protection. Right. That's right. Amen. And when that happens, man, the enemy has got free will to get in your business. And that's when, a, that's when the crap hits the fan. That's when the trucks fall. That's when the, the OD happens. That's when the pregnancy happens. That's when the STD happens. That's when the bad stuff happens, right? That's where it happens at. Because God doesn't want it to happen. But he's like, you know what? I love you so much. I give you free will. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And like a bad dog, sometimes we hit the end of the chain. And some people are more stubborn than other people. And I am as about probably as stubborn as they come. And I mean, God, he gave me so many chances in so many ways and so many. He just kept, kept, kept calling me and kept calling me. But that's... See, that's the reason. I get, in front of these, I get in front of these radio and TV hosts. I've been on like 30 TV shows and like 100 radio shows, and they say, why do you think you're the one person that's lived? Why do you think you're the one that God has saved? God told me what to say. Here's the answer. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, right? What's my last name? Trouble. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I can't stand up here and tell you God saved me because I was a good guy. The only reason why God saved me, he saved me to set the bar so stinking low to say that if I would do it for that knucklehead, I would do it for anyone. He didn't deserve it. He's the least, the chief of sinners, man. Right? There are two people that are dead because of me. I mean, I've done so much bad stuff, lived so against God and against people. And he's like, man, in my sin, think about it, in my disobedience, I call out to him and say, Lord, help me. After, in my disobedience, I get hurt. He sends the angels. Then he sends a two-month-old baby Christian to pray me back to life. Then he sends a guy from across the United States to pray, and I have a creative miracle. It's the reason why I'm alive. Thing after thing after thing, and I, and I got hurt in my disobedience. That's mercy. That's grace. That's the God that we serve. Amen? It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you've lived. It doesn't matter where you're at. God is calling you out and he's saying, I love you. I want better for you than the world has. I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future just to be obedient and listen to me. Live the holy life because it's better for you. Not because I'm trying to rain on your parade. Not because I'm trying to stop you from having fun. But because I'm trying to protect you and love you and see you be blessed and see you be a blessing. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. And you know what? I'm going to spend the rest of my life. I walked away from a six-figure job that I loved. 
and I get like squat now, right? We had to, we lost everything. All my savings, all my 401k, all my toys, I lost everything. The only thing I still have is my house. I lost it all. We had hundreds of thousands of dollars of work act. I didn't have workman's comp, so we had my 20% of the insurance, because in the States, right, we gotta pay for it. My 20% was like 400 and some thousand dollars, right? We lost everything, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing this. I'm gonna spend the rest of my life telling people that God is real and that we have to think about our eternal destination. So here, I'm, I'm stopping right here, I promise. So here it is. So I would not do this testimony justice. I would not, so I wouldn't do this justice unless I ended with this. So we see miracles happen. I told you like the, the First Nations lady yesterday. I mean, we see miracles. We see blind eyes and deaf ears. We've seen God do so much crazy stuff and tumors falling off and all this stuff. God is a God of miracles. I couldn't do any of that. Only God can, right? He's the great physician. We see him do this stuff. We've seen people get out of wheelchairs. We've seen paralyzed walk. We've seen people on stage four, deathbed, feeding tube cancer, get up and walk away. I've seen it. But you know what? None of those things are going to last. There's eight times in the Bible where somebody was raised from the dead that I count, eight times in the Bible. Jesus raised this dude named Lazarus. Has anybody here ever met Lazarus? No, why not? He died again. God raised me from the dead, literally. Had this two-month-old baby Christian pray for me. Raised me from the dead. But guess what? Unless Jesus comes back first, I'm going to die again, just like Lazarus. Every blind eye, every deaf ear that Jesus prayed for in the Bible, all those people died, and those miracles are for naught. The only miracle that lasts, the only miracle that's real, like that is really eternally real, is salvation. Where is this, where's Lazarus right now? Come on, where's Lazarus right now? In heaven with Jesus. His body might be in the ground. He might be dust. But the real Lazarus, see, just the envelope is in the ground right now for now, right? The real Jesus in La the real, the real Lazarus, the real one is in heaven with Jesus. Amen? So here it is. In 1 John chapter 5, it says that we should know, we should have confidence of our salvation. If you're here tonight and you don't know 100% for sure your salvation. If you don't know it, if you don't have confidence in that, the Bible says you should. So I sometimes will be ministering one-on-one -on -one with people and I'll say, hey man, you know, when you die, I can guarantee this. This is not a scare tactic. I can guarantee this. From the oldest person here to probably like the youngest person, every person in this room is going to die. That's it. The way of all men, David talked about, right? We're all going to die. Every person in this room is going to die. The thing is, when we die and our spirit leaves our body, where are we going to go? Are we going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus or are we going to spend eternity in hell? How much sin is allowed in heaven? None. Zero sin in heaven. So the best little old lady that is, you know, gets the cat out of the tree and like nice to everybody, but she doesn't have Jesus, when, her, when she dies and her spirit leaves her body, she's carrying her sin. Her spirit's carrying her sin. It can't go into heaven because heaven is perfect. So she's only got one place to go, right? I get people that walk up because they don't want to hear that hell is real. Hell is real, man. Google atheist near-death experience. I've talked to people that have died that didn't believe in God and gone to hell and they didn't even believe in the place. But they went there when they died before a doctor resuscitated them, right? It's real. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. We can't go to heaven unless we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior to wash away our sins and that's the only deal, right? We can't go there unless that. So people talk about it and they say, oh, it seems like it's too simple, but it says in the Bible, everyone, everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. And if you're here tonight and if you don't know for sure that when your spirit leaves your body, because people say like, well, I hope, I hope so. I hope when I die, I'm gonna go to heaven. I mean, I, I'm a pretty good person. These are kind of questions and answers I get, you know. I'm a pretty good person. You know, I'm better than my jerk brother-in-law. I'm better than my little sister. You know, I'm better than my mom or my dad. How do you know if you're ever good enough? If it's on you, how do you know if you're ever good enough? Maybe you had to go to 500 church services before you die and you only went to 490. Maybe you had to give 150,000 before you die and you only gave 140. And God's like, oh, 10,000 short. How do you know? If it's on you, how do you ever know if it's enough? But if it's based on the finished work of the cross, then you can have confidence. It's not on us, because it can never be on us. If it's based on something he did, then we can say, it's not of me, it's of him. I accept what he did. Then we can have confidence. That's the only way we can have confidence. So I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed, please. It'll be worth, you know, this 10 minutes of this part, it'll be worth it if there's two, if there's three, if there's five, if there's one. This will be worth it, taking the 10 minutes, right? If you're here tonight and you don't know for sure that when you die and your spirit leaves your body that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right where you're at. This is a decision between you and God. 
Nobody's going to stand with you when, at the judgment seat. It's going to be you and God. That's it. So right now, between you and God, if you don't know for sure that when you die, that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, maybe you're just playing church. Maybe you've been to church your whole life. I see 80-year-old people that have been to church their whole life receive Jesus and say, you know what? I never repented of my sins. I never said, God, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. Come into my life and, and wash my sins away. I just thought that I could do it by being a good person. And I see the person that's never been to church and it's the first time they walk in the church except Jesus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're at. I don't know any of you. It doesn't matter your walk. It's between you and God. But I know this. When you die and your spirit leaves your body, you're going to have to answer. And either your sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb or you're carrying them. And if you're carrying them, you can't go to heaven. Because I believe what the Bible says. I said, Jesus, if you're real, he showed up. I believe he's real. And if, because I believe he's real, I believe everything that book says. Amen? It's real. If you're feeling a tug on your heart, and you don't have that confidence, you don't have that assurance, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to count to three. Just raise your hand right where you're at. I'm going to do a quick count. You put your hands down, and we're all going to say a prayer together. All right? That tug on your heart is Jesus. He doesn't do the Chuck Norris kick and knock your door down. It's a gentle tug. And you know, either you've got that confidence, you've got that assurance, or you don't. If you don't, today is a day of salvation, because you know what? You don't know if you got it tomorrow. If that's you, if you're feeling that tug, just, just raise it up on three. One, every head bowed, every eye closed. One, two, three. Raise them up high. Raise them up high. All right, put them down. Okay. So for the two people that raised their hand, I know there's, you know, see, God shows me things. You know what? I know there's a couple more. I'm just going to say it one more time. So you two that raised your hand, you don't have to raise your hand again, but I just, I don't want to leave, with, you know, if this man, if you're feeling this tug, it's 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 just a, you know maybe it's just a seed planting night, but maybe tonight's a God want maybe tonight's a night, maybe tonight's a night and God wants you. I know He wants you. I know He wants you. If that's you, not those two people that raised their hand already, but if God, if you're feeling that tug and and you know it, you know and have that confidence, you don't have that assurance. Today is the day of salvation. Just raise your hand up right now. Go ahead, raise them up. Okay, put it, keep it down. All right. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're all going to say this prayer together if you want to. If you're, if you're cool with this, if you're a Christian, it should be no problem already. So just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I'm, a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you and other people. This day, I repent of my sin. This day, I ask for and receive your forgiveness. This day, I invite you into my heart. To be my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again. You conquered sin, death, and the devil. I pray that from this day forward, I would have intimacy with you. From this day forward, I would have assuredness, confidence of my salvation and my relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know what? Let's, can we give Jesus a big clap? Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, God. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 So it says if there's one that gives their heart to the Lord, there's a party in heaven. Right? Right? If there's one, there was three. So there's like a triple party going on or something. I don't know what that looks like. Lord, we just thank you, God. We worship you. We glorify you. You know, just take this and this. Thank you, Lord. Right on. Just praise your name, God. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name. You're a holy God. You're an awesome God. You're a worthy God. One that's worthy, worthy, worthy. Okay, so I'm just going to preface before... <laughs> Before I say what I'm about to say next, I'm going to just preface it with this. So uh, Saturday night, I'm at this place, and the Lord starts giving words and knowledge at the end, and he's like, call this one out, and I said, if somebody was just at the doctor, and you got a right lung that's messed up, and you, you can't breathe right, you got shortness of breath, and the doctors are, you know, looked at it, and they said they can't do anything for it. You know, just raise your hand right where you're at. You don't have to come forward. We're just going to, as a group, pray, and God's going to heal you. And, um, I, you know, it was like three, and then there was that one, and the person wouldn't take it. 
So I'm like, you know what, God, if I'm in front of everybody, I'm like, God, if I missed it, I'm sorry, I just repent, you know, if I muddied the water. But if I didn't, and that's true, just, Lord, you know, work on that person's heart that they just raise their hand right now so we can pray and the person wouldn't take it. And the faith in the room just like us, you know. And uh, so I just stopped. And we just invited people forward. And we saw God do a bunch of crazy miracles. I mean, he was doing his, what he does best. And uh, at the very end, this little old lady comes up to me. And she goes, it was me. I got the right lung. It's, I can't breathe. And I was at the doctor and all that. She said, but I had to go to the bathroom. And I was afraid to come up because I had to go to the bathroom. And it, she sat there for another, like, hour and a half. So she didn't have to go to the bathroom. She was embarrassed, right? And so we prayed. And guess what? Her lung got healed, and she could breathe perfectly. And we, I see that so much, right? I see that so much where people don't receive words until they come up two hours later. But what, what they don't realize is they stop what God is trying to do in the room by raising faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I just want to say that before I say that there's somebody here that you hurt your right leg on a bicycle. God told me this on the drive here. You hurt your right leg on a bicycle, and it's something that acts up. It's not like crazy bad, but it's something that acts up, and he just wants that to be healed. You don't have to come forward. Just whoever it is, raise your hand right where we're at. We're going to pray. Whoever is that, whoever that person is, mess something up, right leg on the bicycle. And it's you. Okay, so you guys that are on them, just put your hands on them, right? This is the way it works. See, when God gives a word of knowledge, it's like Michael Jordan running towards the end of the court uncontested. What's going to happen? Come on. What's going to happen? Slam dunk every single time. It's every time. When he gives a word of knowledge, it's an every time thing, right? That's it. So I know that I know that when God told me that the dude, the person that hurt their right leg on the bicycle is going to get healed, or any word, if it's a word of knowledge, it's a slam dunk. So just, okay? So we're just, so we're just put your hands towards that guy. Everybody in here, put your hands towards that guy. So Lord, we just lift that guy up. We know that um, you're not going to bring up a word of knowledge unless you're going to do something about it. You brought it up. You're not going to waste your breath. You're not going to waste our time. So, Lord God, we just worship you. We glorify you. We praise you. Jesus, you are awesome. Jesus, you're awesome. We love you in this place, Lord. We love you in this place. We worship you. We glorify you. And we thank you. There is no sickness. There's no sorrow. There's no suffering in heaven. And there's none in your presence. So we thank you for your presence even now. Even now, in Jesus' name, we speak healing over that right leg. In Jesus' name, we say pain, suffering, sickness, infirmity. Go in the name of Jesus and never, ever return, even now, ever, ever. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I know it's done. It's done. 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 Totally done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Could you do anything to make it hurt before? Stand up. Tell us, man. Come on. <laughs> How about now? <laughs> right? Jesus? Jesus! Jesus! Lord! Yeah! Lord. Okay, so this next one is going to be a little bit harder for the person to raise their hand, but please, please raise your hand, please. I'm serious. Don't let this slip. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed, please. There's a person here that's so, they're fighting, man. They're fighting with his depression. And his depression is beaten up so bad that like me, you keep contemplating and saying, I just want it to be over. I just want it to end because, you know what? I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my rope. Please, please don't let that go by. God wants to heal the, you know what it is? Here, I'm telling you what it is. God already told me. It's demonic oppression. It's the chain that's on you that God wants to break off. If that's you, if everybody thinks that you're Mr. Cool or Mrs. Cool and like you got no problems and you're afraid to raise your hand because of that, please don't let this slip because God is giving you an opportunity. But he's going to have you step out in faith by raising your hand, admitting this so that, you know what, what's, in the, what's brought into light, when it's t brought out of the darkness and into the light, it has no power. And that's, that's what God is asking, your little tiny part. Because when you do that little tiny part, think about it, all the crap is going to go away. It's just going to be over. Does that make sense? Come on, if that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. All right, right on. Two people. You know, all right, three people. Four people. Oh, God, you're so good. All right, so for those four people, for those four people, you just put your hands on them. So you got two guys right behind you. Put your hands on them. You put your hands on that woman, and you put your hands on that person back there. The only one that I knew, see, God sometimes will show me the person beforehand. The only one that I knew, ma'am, was you. You were the only one that I knew for sure. I didn't realize there was more. Put your hands on that woman back there, please. So, Lord God, you are so awesome. You rock. 
and you come to set the captive free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we just speak freedom where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom, there's liberty. We speak freedom and liberty for those four people in Jesus' name, and we come against a spirit of depression, and we say instead he's given a garment of praise. He's given us a garment of praise, and we just break off those chains right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, those chains are broken. Those heavy weights that are on the back fall off, drop off right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for just a supernatural touch that your, that your God, that your presence, that your healing anointing, that your power be released in their lives and there would be freedom. And I pray that when they wake up, they jump out of bed and go, I am so happy I'm alive and I'm so happy Jesus loves me and I'm his son and I'm his daughter and today is going to be awesome because God has got my back and I can trust him. I can trust him because he's faithful. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We pray from this day forward, God, from this day forward, those chains be broken off in Jesus' name. Come on, let's, come on. Jesus! Jesus! Lord, come on, Lord, we love you, God. Lord, we love you, God, we love you. Jesus, we love you. You are so good. You are so good to us, God. You're so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. We thank you, God. We praise you. We give you all the honor. You say you'll not share your glory with another. You say you'll not share your glory with another. We give you all the honor and all the glory. We give you all the honor and we give you all the glory. You say you'll not share your glory with another. We give it to you. You're the healer. You're the great physician. You're the one that we lift up. You're the one to magnify. You're the one we glorify. It's all about you. There's nothing about us. It's all about you, God. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. God, we humble ourselves before you, and we can't even imagine why you'd want to love us, but you do. And you say that you want to show us how wide, how deep, how high, how long your love is. And Lord, help us. We pray for that revelation. Lord, we pray for that revelation. God, we pray for that revelation of your love. We pray for that revelation of your love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody here that you're in war, you're, it's your job. You're being persecuted because of Christian values. You got some Christian values going on because of it. You're being persecuted, and you're like thinking you're thinking about quitting right now. You're saying, "I'm just going to quit because I'm, I don't want to put up with this crap." And God wants to encourage you and say, "You know what? He's put you there for a reason. You're a light in the darkness. You're sitting on a hill, and He wants you to know. He wants you to know that He's got your back. He's seeing you crying. He's seeing you being like attacked because of this. Who is it? Raise your hand. Who is it? Two people. Okay, so put just you know what? Put your hands on them." Right now, put your hands on them. Thank you, God. Well, Lord, we just lift this up to you right now. We know that you said you are a vindicator. You're our advocate. You're the one that goes for us. We pray for justice. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your grace. We pray for your supernatural strength and encouragement. May these women be encouraged in their job. May they be encouraged in their job because you put them there to be a light. You put them there to be salt. So we pray that you give them supernatural divine revelation, protection, knowledge. Know what to say or know what not to say. No one to talk, no one to keep their mouth shut. Give them the wisdom to do what you've called them to do and be the light that you've called them to be. And we pray that there would be all the seeds that are already planted. They might not see. They might not even see that they come to fruition. I pray, Lord God, that they would begin in the future to see these planted seeds come to fruition and your name be honored and your name be glorified and raised raised up because you've called them to do this and they're being faithful. So we know that when we're faithful, we're blessed and other people are blessed. Jesus, come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, thank you, God. Praise your name, God. Thank you, Lord. You're a just God, a merciful God. You're a holy God, holy God. Holy, holy God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody is praying for somebody named Craig. There's somebody here that's praying for a guy named Craig. And Craig is uh, like, nothing is changing. Like, you're praying, and God says you're praying, and you feel like your prayers aren't getting heard because nothing is changing in Craig's life. And you're going, Lord, come on. And you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, but nothing's changing. And God wants to encourage you and say, Craig, it, you know, he's working in that guy's life. He's working in Craig's life. And in the background, you might not see it, but it's happening. And so who is it? Raise your hand. Who's praying for Craig? Somebody praying for Craig and nothing is happening. Nothing's happening in that person's life. And you're saying, you know what? God, are you not listening to my prayers? Who is it? Lord, if I miss this, God, I'm sorry. Repent. Let it drop to the ground with no nothing. But if it's from you, we just call it forth. If there's somebody here with a Craig in their life that things are going crazy on and, and nothing is changing and it's going bad and, it's, and, it, and they can see it, but nothing seems to be getting better, Lord, just pop it up even now. In Jesus' name. Man, I would expect that you would know like instantly. 
Oh, okay. There, I just didn't see it up there. I'm sorry. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Can you just put your hands on that woman, please? So we're all going to pray together for Craig. See, God knows. He, Craig is God's son, right? Craig is God's son, and he loves him, and he wants him. So we just call him in. Full salvation, healing, deliverance for Craig. Lord, we lift him up. We, in, Lord, we just lift him up to you. He's your son, and you wouldn't want us all to pray, and you wouldn't bring this up unless you're doing something about it. And we trust you, and we worship you, and we glorify you because you are high, and you're exalted, and you're magnified, and you're king of kings, and you're lord of lords, and you're on the throne, and you're in the miracle business today. You're in the miracle business today, Lord. We just trust you. We lift that man up. We ask that your life-giving power just be released in his life. We pray that every place he goes, the hounds of heaven get him, Lord God, and that he's just like chased down and overtaken with your blessing. Overtaken with blessing in every area of his life, Lord. And for this woman, I, Lord, I know that part of the reason why you gave this word was to encourage this woman so that she knows that her prayers are being heard. Even though nothing is changing, she's praying and you're hearing those prayers. And Lord, we just thank you for that encouraging word for her that she may know that you are listening even though nothing is changing. And for the rest of you, see, the reason why he'd bring that up is for the rest of you. That you're praying about things and you're saying, God, this mountain isn't moving. You told me to speak to the mountain, but it's not moving. He's saying, look, this lady's praying for Craig and that mountain's not moving, but I'm listening and he's listening to you and he's listening to you and he's listening to you and he's saying, just keep praying and trust me and have faith because I love you and I want the best for you. Amen. Lord, we just thank you. Jesus, oh God, you're so good. Jesus, you're so good. Jesus, you're so good to us, God. You're so good, Lord. You're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. I think, there, I think there's a Brian here that's here tonight. There's a Brian. You got some stuff going on. What's Brian? Brian, raise your hand. You got some stuff going on. What's going on? Is there a Brian? I heard the name Brian so strong. And, he, and I, I might have missed it, but I didn't hear. I didn't sound like he said somebody praying for Brian. Like, Lord, again, if I missed it, God, if I missed it, I'm sorry. But there's a, he's part of this body. And what's going on? What's going on with him? Okay. It's your son? Amen. Thank you, Lord. What's that? Okay. There it is. That's why he's here. That's why he's here. He's here in son, here in spirit. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good, Lord. So, Lord, we just lift up Brian. And so we're calling it out right now. We're saying it at 5 after 10, uh, whatever time, West Coast time or whatever this is, 5 after time, 5 after 10 right now, West Coast time, whatever that is, Africa time, we're saying no more seizures from this minute forward in Jesus' name. Done. Over. History, we've seen you do it before, God. Jesus, we've seen you do it before. You said, speak to the mountain. So we speak the mountain of epilepsy in Jesus' name, mountain of seizures, whatever the cause of those seizures are, in Jesus' name. And we say, broken off, done, right now in Jesus' name. Done. Chains falling off right now in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. Lord, we just worship you, God. We glorify you. You are so good. God, you're so good. We just worship you. We glorify you. We thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, God. Praise your name, God. We just worship God. We love you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we just love you. We thank you. You're so good to us, God. You're so good, God. You're just so good. You're just so good. We trust you, God. We just trust you. We just trust you. We thank you, Lord. God, we just trust you. Oh, Lord, we just trust you. Okay, there's somebody here that's dealing with gambling addiction. Come on, don't let it go. Just God wants to set you free from it. Don't, don't let this slip through your fingers. Don't be embarrassed. It doesn't matter. We've all sinned. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That sin is no worse than the other sin. God just wants you. He knows that you're fighting with it. See, the reason why he's showing this person and they're struggling with this gambling addiction and they're struggling with the gambling addiction and they feel bad about it and they're saying, oh, I shouldn't do this, but then they do it and they feel bad and they do it and they feel bad and they do it and they feel bad and it's back and forth. Just the way I was with drugs. That same, that same thing. If that's you, just raise your hand. Right where we're at, we're going to pray, and God's going to break this thing off right now. Come on. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. God's going to break this thing off right now. That was like so, I, it was out of the blue. It was over here. And, you know, that's when I know it's God. Like, he interrupts my thoughts. He, like, drops something, and it's like, boom, comes out of nowhere. And that's just what happened right there. See, God wants you just to be done. God wants you just to be off of you. And, you've, you know, you repented. 
you said you're sorry, but it just pops up. It just pops up, and God just wants it to go away for you because he sees the, the struggle. See, he sees the struggle, and he's seeing you because that's what he showed me. He showed me anguish on a face. Like, it's like, oh, I feel bad about this, and you know what? And then it just pops up. Just raise your hand. Whoever it is, just raise your hand. And so it's causing you anguish, and you keep, like, struggling with it? Okay, so, all right, so maybe it could be you, but if it's not you, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lose it for somebody else, but is it, I saw anguish on your face. Does it cause you anguish when the thought comes? Anybody, there's something you're fighting with? Okay, so, all right, I, I saw anguish on a face, and so I heard the word gambling. I saw anguish on the face. That's, I mean, I literally saw the face with, like, scrunched up eyes, anguish, you know, so if it's somebody else, come on, if it's somebody else, just raise your hand and we'll just pray and it'll just be done. If it is somebody else, just raise your hand and we'll just be done with this. God, I'll just finish it off. And, okay, so Lord, if, I, if it is this guy, if that's it, I mean, I don't think it is. I'm going to say it. I think it's a woman. It's a female face I saw. I saw a female face and it's scrunched up. Come on, if that's you, just raise your hand. Okay, so do this, do this. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, and you want to be done with this, you don't. You know what? At least go this far. At least meet God halfway. If that's you and you're struggling, just raise your hand right where you're at. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just raise your hand right where you're at. Okay, so Lord, again, if I missed it, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Lord, if it's not for me, let it drop to the ground, like unsp undone, unspoken. I apologize. I repent. But if it's from you, God, we know that you want restoration. You want reconciliation. So we just pray. If that is, if that is someone else, if there's a woman that's having that here, Lord, we just pray that, uh, that there be freedom because Jesus comes to set the captive free. And if it is this guy back here where the Lord is just alerting to what the enemy attacking, we just come against the lies of the enemy. We come against those attacks, and we tell them to drop off. We tell them to drop off in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. God, I don't want to end like this. Lord, I don't want to sit end like this, Lord. Jesus, we trust you, and we glorify you, and we thank you for everything that you've done in this place tonight, God. You've been so awesome, and you are so good to us, and we just praise you. We just praise you, God. We just praise you and we just lift you up. We just praise you and we just lift you up. We just praise you and we just lift you up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Praise your name, God. We just thank you. We just thank you. We'll do whatever you want, God. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? We're just here for you. We're here for you, God. Whatever you want. So I'll just say this. I'll just admit this. This is a, a shortcoming in me. When, when like one falls like that, I mean, if, it, if they go, it can go for like an, a half an hour. It can go for 45 minutes, one after another after another. But when one drops like that, it like shakes my faith, honestly. And I start going, oh, God, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to like misrepresent. I don't want to do anything wrong. And so it then will shortly stop because I stop it, basically, because I start choking them. And so, Lord, we just lift it up. And so right now, I just heard a name, but I'm not, usually he'll tell me somebody's praying for this person or it's the person here. And so I keep hearing the name John. So I'm just going to step on a limb and I saw John. And so I know there's an issue with a John, but I don't know if it's somebody's praying for the John or it's a here that's a John. So if that's you, if that's you, just raise your hand if you know what that means, if that means something to you. If you know, what is it? You know a John and nothing's, it's not changing, it's not getting better. Something's going on with his life. Can you tell us what the prayer request is? You don't have to if you don't want to. Salvation and freedom. All right, let's all lift up John. So, Lord, we just lift up John right now. We just lift up John right now. We just thank you for his full salvation, 
his, his full salvation, healing, deliverance, his whole life, Lord God. We just praise you. King of kings and Lord of lords, we know that you say you want, you desire all men, all women to be saved. So we just lift up John to you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. Praise your name, your holy God. Awesome, God. Thank you for John, Jesus' name. You know what? Before we go into like one-on-one uh, -on -one ministry, I'll, you know, I'll, pray. I'll stay till... <laughs> God, it's you, God, it's you. Yeah, right there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. You got John's number and you got his back. You got his back, God. You got his back. You got his back, Lord. Yeah. Jesus, you got his back. You know what? I missed it because I heard it twice. Did I say that I heard it twice? Did I say I heard it twice? Okay, I heard it twice, and at sea, I gotta be careful. I gotta, understand, I gotta pay attention to that because sometimes when I hear it a couple times, I'll think, oh, he's just repeating, so I listen. But sometimes when he's repeating, it's because it's like, boom, it's two people, yeah. So, Lord, we just thank you, we worship you, we lift up John, and we pray for a, the hedge of protection around John, a bubble of protection. I pray that cocaine is repulsive to him. May cocaine be repulsive to him. May he think about what it's like at the end of the night, not the first line, not the first puff, not the perfect first hit, but the last one when it's all gone and he's ugly and he's nasty and he's yucky inside. Let him like fast forward to the end of the tape, Lord God. And when he thinks about it, go, oh, no, I don't want to go there because I know where it ends up and I don't want to go back to jail. And so we pray for revelation, knowledge, and wisdom, discernment to well up with inside John. And for that hedge of protection, Lord, we pray that evil influences will be shut off, cut off right now in Jesus' name. And may there be a no-fly zone for the enemy over John and his house and wherever he's at in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we just plead for him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, praise your name, God. Praise your name. So what I was about to say before, uh, thank you so much for bringing that up, man. Thank you. Can we do Break Every Chain again? Can we do, is that, right, is that all right with you guys? I mean, I'll stay, like I said, I, I'm used to staying until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning because I usually can't shut up, and we start praying, and what happens, we start praying, miracles start happening, and then people are like getting on the phone, like, get grandma down here, get out of bed, God's doing miracles, and get this guy down here, and people start showing up, and like if they live stream stuff on TV, pretty soon there's more people in the end than there is in the beginning because they're seeing people get healed and saved and delivered, and they just don't want to leave, and they're coming up three times for prayer. I'm like, all right, man, come on, just do it all at once, or whatever, you know, but they're calling people and so God like he loves us and he wants the best for us right I don't know can you tell God is exciting right I used to think that a good time I used to think it was a good time was going to the bar having a pocket full of green weed having an eight ball drinking my crown drinking my Jaeger bombs dragging some chick back to my house that is not fun that is not good at all the best time is seeing somebody get saved healed delivered amen amen